The desert is still. The night seems endless, silent, and at peace, until it's pierced by the sound of gunshots and screams. Deep in the Sahara, the SCP Foundation is waging war against a newly discovered enemy. A squad of Foundation agents is retreating, trying to get away from the ones who massacred their allies. They were attempting to eliminate the threat using conventional means, but their rifles were no match for the reality-bending entities of the Kingdom of Abaddon. The retreating agents cover one another as they make their way back to the extraction point. The enemy force advances. Agents that are caught too close to the sorcerers of Abaddon disintegrate into thin air. This is not an enemy they can defeat. The SCP agents need to get back to base and relay what they have found to their superiors. Out of the hundreds of agents sent into the Sahara that night, only a handful make it out alive. They are debriefed by their superiors at the Foundation who classified the anomalous humanoids under the highest of threat levels. The Kingdom of Abaddon is a threat. The Kingdom of Abaddon must be eliminated. Reconnaissance done prior to the disastrous mission had alerted the Foundation to the presence of anomalies in the region, but they had no idea how strong the anomalous humanoids would be. From data gathered through old reports, it seemed like the Abaddon humanoids were responsible for the deaths of no fewer than 75 Foundation personnel, and had stolen at least 12 different items from the Foundation. The leaders of the SCP Foundation tasked Research Team Omega-5 with developing a weapon that would be capable of destroying the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. The weapon they are researching must be capable of long-range destruction, because the moment any Foundation agent gets close to the area, they are vaporized by the reality-manipulating powers of its inhabitants. The project is given the name Twins of God, and is led by a Foundation doctor known only by the designation O51. O51 is popular in the SCP Foundation, well known for his in-depth research and charismatic personality, making him the perfect person to lead such a project. And O51 recently came across an anomaly that he believes holds the solution the Foundation has been looking for to defeat the Kingdom of Abaddon. Item 001. And so the Omega-5 team gets to work. They discover that the anomaly has incredible powers when put inside a host, which they refer to as an Item 001 entity, and set up a series of experiments using different people to harness its energy. The first series of tests all end in tragedy. The anomaly causes the entity it inhabits to become intensely radioactive. Anyone who gets close to it succumbs to immediate radiation sickness, and eventually, death. To stop the radiation problems, the Omega-5 research group intensifies the containment procedures. O51 receives reports from the higher-ups that the Kingdom of Abaddon has attacked another Foundation facility in Sudan. Long-range defense is needed ASAP. The administrator puts more pressure on Omega-5, and especially its leader O51, to solve the problems of Item 001 and develop a weapon that can save the Foundation. He stays awake for days on end, working tirelessly to create a safe and controllable Item 001 entity. Although there are signs that the weapon will work, it is still unpredictable. <gasps> when Item 001 is initiated, the host entity becomes paralyzed, suffers severe cerebral hemorrhaging, and soon a new host is needed before testing can begin again. And that's not the only thing that goes wrong. Whenever the anomaly is put into a new host, sudden and random destruction of on-site structures and personnel take place. O51 knows, though, that if this power can be harnessed and controlled in the right way, that it could be the weapon that the Foundation needs to wipe out the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. In order to control Item 001, O51 has a mind kill switch implanted in its host's brains. O51 can activate the implant to incapacitate its host and immediately stop the unwanted destruction. Countless hosts are terminated by this mind kill switch in the early trials conducted by the Omega-5 team, but progress continues to be made, and eventually a hypothesis is formulated. Perhaps the disastrous side effects of Item 001 can be offset by spreading the anomaly across multiple subjects. They theorize that the immense mental load of the anomaly can be distributed among several hosts, thus reducing the toil it takes on each and giving them the ability to control its immense power. But O51 and the Omega-5 team need more data, and for that, they need more bodies. They consult with the director of Site-17, and it is concluded that the nearby town of San Marco would be an appropriate place to get the additional test subjects they require. On a quiet Sunday morning, 
Omega-5, along with support from a squad of armed SCP agents, storm into the San Marcos de la Vida Sterna Church during the middle of Mass. They gather up a number of the younger congregants and bring them back to the site where item 001 is housed. The researchers quickly ran through their new supply of test subjects, though, and Omega-5 would need to get even more if their research was to continue. Instead of going back and forth between the testing facility and San Marcos, O51 decided to move the entire Item 001 operation to the town itself. He renames the town Testing Site 001, and Omega-5 rounds up 23 of the healthiest subjects they can find for use in the next series of research yeah. tests. A few weeks after occupying the town of San Marco, Omega-5 makes its most substantial progress yet. Just as they theorized, by spreading out the anomaly of Item 001 across a specific group of hosts, they can control its powers. The test may have cost the lives of almost everyone in the town, but the ends certainly justify the means. The Kingdom of Abaddon poses an existential threat to the SCP Foundation, after all, and thanks to this research, they will soon have a weapon capable of bringing them victory. The Foundation Administer criticized O51's methods, but can't argue with his results. Unfortunately, O51 has a dark secret, a secret that disturbs even the most hardened and loyal members of Omega-5 a secret that has to do with the Item 001 hosts. The hosts that Omega-5 has made its major progress with are not the ordinary test subjects normally used by the Foundation. No, the test subjects O51 makes his breakthrough with are children, nine of them to be exact, all between four and 11 years old. Despite being told specifically by the Foundation Administrator to only test on adults, the research required O51 to break the chain of command and follow the science down the path it led. The children are contained in a reinforced bunker where only O51 and a select few have access. They are technically alive, but are functionally brain dead. The group of nine children share a hive mind that can process information, and more importantly, can unleash the full potential of the implanted anomaly, creating and controlling a devastating power. But not everyone is thrilled with what they've achieved. Members of Omega-5 are haunted by the screams of the children that they force to be part of their weapons development program. They describe their merging with Item 001 as being a process that rips out their souls and replaces them with something much more sinister. In fact, all of Omega-5 regret what they have been a part of and what they've done, all except 051. The nine children can channel unprecedented amounts of energy from an unknown origin that Omega-5 hypothesizes comes from an extra-dimensional source, which is then used to unbind atoms at the quantum level. When the right activation words are spoken, it appears as though this tremendous power gives the children the ability to annihilate anything in the entire universe. It's a gun to end all guns, and only 051 has the key to control it. The Nine Children works so well with an item 001 that Omega-5 reclassifies it to include the Nine Children themselves. They are not just the entity housing or controlling item 001, they permanently become item 001. Once Omega-5 has a better understanding of item 001, they begin to run tests to find out the full extent of its abilities. First, they test the distance item 001 can reach. The initial test that Omega-5 carries out is on a steel rod placed 5 kilometers away. O51 orders the children to destroy the target. Moments later, the phone next to O51 begins to ring. When he picks it up, the observer tasked with watching the pole is on the other end. He informs O51 that the steel rod has been completely vaporized. O51 is not satisfied though. He has another pole sent out, this time placed 8,000 kilometers away from the nine children. O51 asks the children to destroy that rod. Almost immediately, the phone rings again. The target has been vaporized. O51 smiles. The next series of tests Omega-5 runs on item 001 are to determine the maximum size of an object that can be destroyed. The tests start out with a steel sphere, three meters in diameter, placed 1,000 kilometers from item 001. O51 orders the children to destroy the object. It is instantly vaporized. O51 has seen enough small tests. It's time for something big. So he does something that will later be questioned by everyone at the SCP Foundation. He orders the nine children to destroy a Church of the Broken God worship site in Turkey. Not long after the destruction order is given to item 001, reports begin coming in. 
the worship site has been obliterated with no observable damage to the surrounding area. Deadly and precise. 051 closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. He looks as if he's overcome by an immense spiritual experience. He opens his eyes, leans over to the children, and whispers the name of someone. Later that day, 051 finds out that the target he had named has been vaporized. The success of Omega-5 in Item 001 is relayed to the administration of the Foundation. They are so impressed that they make plans to use Item 001 to eliminate the Abaddon threat once and for all. However, one of the heads of the Foundation, Administrator Williams, has major concerns about the way 051 is running the program. The updates that 051 has been sending have become less scientific and more philosophical, more spiritual. Administrator Williams sends a letter to 051 reassuring him that he is doing good work. But once the mission to destroy the Kingdom of Abaddon is completed, 051 will be promoted to director and reassigned to the newly constructed Site-19. For the good of the Foundation, and maybe the rest of the world, he'll be permanently moved away from Item 001. 051's response is short and to the point. I am fine, Administrator. The project is finished. We will complete our task when you arrive. Administrator Williams arrives at Site-001 a few days later. He is greeted by 051 and the Omega-5 team. Williams can't help but notice that 051 has a strange look in his eyes. It is the look of a crazed man who has been lost in his work, and who has, perhaps, lost himself. Williams puts the thought away, though, and walks with 051 and his accompanying agents to the viewing area, where the powers of Item 001 will be demonstrated. Administrator Williams and the other agents watch from a protected viewing room as 051 enters the chamber of his new superweapon. It's time to see if their weapon that has had so much time, effort, sweat, tears, and especially blood poured into it will have been worth it. Everyone watches as 051 leans over and says the name of the Abaddon Citadel to the nine children. All at once, they start to glow. No one observing can see what has happened in the far-off kingdom but they know something big has happened. The administrator is thrilled, but notices something. 051 hesitated a moment while leaning over the children before standing back up. Did he whisper something else to them? And then Administrator Williams vaporizes, pulled apart at an atomic level before he has the chance to scream. What's going on? The agents standing next to where Administrator Williams previously existed begin to yell and pull out their guns. They burst through the door of the observation room and run down the hallway towards where 051 and the nine children are located. The arm agents rush into the room, but 051 is gone. The nine children are still. Over the next few weeks, 051 is reported to be seen several times by SCP agents. However, no one is able to catch him, and it appears as though other members of the SCP Foundation have also gone AWOL as well, perhaps joining him on the run. It is unclear what his plan is, but the reports from the reconnaissance team sent into the Sahara make it obvious what the result of his first command to the children was. There isn't a single humanoid or building left in the Kingdom of Abaddon. But even with this victory, the highest levels of the SCP Foundation have an ominous thought lurking in the back of their minds. Where did 051 go? And what is he planning to do next? Following the improper use of item 001 leading to the untimely death of a high-ranking Foundation staff member, the weapon was deemed too dangerous and containment procedures were implemented. Due to the high amount of radiation they were found to emit, the nine children were placed into lead-lined bags and buried under 50 meters of concrete beneath the church of San Marcos de la Vida Eterna. Though all of the children continued to be functionally brain-dead, they still display signs of life despite their containment, and by order of the Overseer Council, have been classified as a Thaumiel entity. It's a quiet evening at Area 11 where the Pietrakau Fontaine Spatial Stabilization Array is housed. A skeleton crew is working overnight to ensure the array is ready for its big test the following day. The Foundation has been working on a particle accelerator that will contain anomalies with the ability to manipulate the nature of space-time. The preliminary tests seem promising, but a few last-minute tweaks to the array are necessary. Unfortunately, it is on this night in 1982 that marks the beginning of the end for the SCP Foundation. Dr. Calvin Desmond is monitoring the array, and he notices as it spools up that there are some minor power fluctuation in one of the stabilization arms. 
This problem is not uncommon. Due to the vast amounts of energy being pumped through the array and the harmonic resonance the machine gives off, which slowly causes the coupling rings to loosen. Calvin Desmet decides that remounting the stabilization rings will be an easy fix, and it's a necessary one. He knows that if the rings fail during the actual test, the array could end up shut down for months. There is still plenty of time, so Calvin Desmet grabs his toolbox and heads down to the array. The machine is still spooling keeping the energy flowing at a constant low rate. There is no danger at the moment, as the inside of the array is shielded from the radiation and energy pulsing through the outer ring. But then, something unexpected happens. The system's primary generator begins to fluctuate uncontrollably. A catastrophic failure is imminent. Sirens begin to sound, the facility is evacuated, and the chamber is sealed. Deep in the bowels of the array, Calvin Desmond cannot hear the evacuation announcement, the humming of the array echoes through the chamber, dampening all sound from the outside world. The array begins to come online while Desmond continues to work on the coupling. He has no idea what is about to happen. Meanwhile, a team of Foundation scientists scramble to get the power fluctuations in the main generator under control. As they frantically work, catastrophe strikes. They initiate the power down cycle, but as the generator struggles to keep the power flow balanced, an energy surge builds up. A massive amount of energy is released all at once, causing the main reactor to explode. The entire structure rocks back and forth, and Desmet is thrown into the side of the array. He too now knows that something is very wrong, and runs for the exit. When he reaches the door, he finds that it has been sealed. In a panic, Desmet continues running through the tube to the next access point. This door has been locked as well. He's never been so scared in his entire life and he shakes uncontrollably from the adrenaline being dumped into his muscles. The surge of energy rushes through the array towards Desmet. A singularity begins to form in the containment chamber. The array is working just as it should, except that there was never supposed to be a person inside as the singularity was brought into existence. Moments after the singularity forms, the massive pull of its gravity causes the stabilizer arm that Desmet had been working on to fail. The side of the array is ripped off and Calvin Desmet stares into the naked eye of the Singularity. Everything is silent and still for a moment. Then the Singularity collapses in on itself, taking the test chamber and much of the research wing with it, along with Dr. Calvin Desmet. Sparking wires hang from the exposed walls and ceiling where the Singularity ripped the main structure away. Water flows into the deep hole carved out of the earth where the array once stood. The scientists from Area 11 look into the crater left by the collapsed singularity. The Foundation Administration sends agents to collect the staff at the site and document the failings of the project. They conclude that the accident was caused by human error. They order the array to be rebuilt, this time using entirely automated systems to eliminate the chances of another mishap occurring. Several years after the catastrophic events at Area 11, a new array is constructed. An intelligent system called NetZack is put in charge of overseeing its functions. It is a supercomputer that is programmed to follow commands, but can autonomously make decisions in order to prevent any failures in the system. Experiments begin again in May of 2006. The new array soon manifests its first singularity in the containment chamber at Area 11, and what happens next will forever change the Foundation and the multiverse. The singularity is kept stable in the array, it seems as if the Foundation has succeeded in trapping and containing spatial anomalies. But as they run more diagnostics on the anomaly, something unexpected happens. The singularity begins to grow in size. The point of infinite gravity threatens to breach containment as it reaches the boundaries of the array. Just before contact, the singularity's growth slows and then stops. Netzak has made the split-second calculations and adjustments necessary to contain the singularity. The artificial intelligence has saved the facility and the lives of everyone in it. Now, sitting in the array, is a thick, rotating cloud of radioactive gas and dust, obscuring the singularity within. As Foundation scientists work rapidly to fix the array, odd events begin to occur. The workers hear noises that sound like painful wailing. Over time, the noises evolve into words and then full sentences. They seem to be originating from the singularity. Using equipment able to penetrate the thick cloud of radioactive gas, the Foundation scientists get a glimpse at the singularity. To their surprise, the singularity has taken on the shape 
of a human. The scientists work frantically to figure out how the singularity could have formed itself into a humanoid shape. Dr. J. Barton Ramsey is the first to try and make contact with the humanoid within the singularity. He finds that the entity cannot communicate in the traditional sense. The massive gravitational pull of the singularity does not allow sound to escape its void. Instead, the entity manipulates gravity to vibrate the suspension rings of the array itself and create sound waves. The being in the singularity whispers in a metallic voice created by the vibrating of the array's rings and says, Johannes Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey steps back from the observation window. How do you know my name? He asks the entity. The humanoid within the swirling gas cloud identifies itself as having the memories of Calvin Desmond. It is not Desmond per se. The being in the singularity is so much more than one person, but it was somehow created by the accident that had sucked Calvin Desmond into the singularity years before. The entity seems to switch between the mind of Desmond and the vast infinity of the cosmos. The Desmond entity asks for an overseer from the Foundation to be brought in. It has a proposal for the O5 Council. When Dr. Ramsey asks why the entity needs to talk to the overseers, it replies that it wants to offer them a way out. The following day, O51 enters the facility and heads to the observation deck. He looks through the reinforced glass at the swirling cloud of radioactive dust then glances at the monitor to see the humanoid shape of the singularity within. He presses the microphone button on the console and addresses the entity. To whom am I speaking? He asks. For simplicity's sake, the entity tells O5-1 to refer to him as Calvin Desmond. O5-1 makes notes of the events unfolding before him and then asks about the way out that Calvin had mentioned. The air is still for a moment. Then, Desmond begins to speak through the vibration of the structure once again. He informs O5-1 that what the SCP Foundation is doing, by securing and containing anomalous entities around the world, is like putting a small band-aid on a much bigger wound. Desmond wants to propose a final solution to all of the Foundation's problems. O5-1 listens intently as the entity unravels the mysteries of where the SCPs have come from. He explains that the anomalies that the Foundation has worked so hard to secure, contain, and protect the human race from are actually bleeding into their reality from a vast multiverse. The only way to stop the manifestation of anomalies into this universe is to destroy all other realities. The entity that is Calvin Desmond tells O5-1 that he is able to bring about this destruction if they release him from the confines of the array. O5-1 is transfixed by the swirling gas that is promising him and everyone else on Earth salvation. He shakes his head in disbelief. Could this be true? O5-1 turns away from the swirling gas and begins to walk away from the viewing glass. I'll need to think about what you're saying. The structure begins to shake slightly. The voice of Calvin Desmond reverberates off of the array a little louder than before. Choose quickly, Overseer. Although it won't happen for decades, eventually a catastrophic SCP event will wipe out life on this planet. Perhaps not in your lifetime, but it will most certainly happen within the lifetime of your children. We will talk again soon. The vibrations slow and then stop completely. There is an eerie stillness in the observation room as O5-1 walks out. The next day, all staff members located at Area 11 are relocated to other Foundation sites and given amnestics. The O5 Council meets in a large circular room with wood paneling and no windows. O5-1 begins the meeting by telling the others what Calvin Desmond had described about the end of the world. He pauses for what seems like an eternity and tells them of Desmond's offer that he could prevent the end of the world but at the cost of destroying an infinite number of other realities. This would mean that all the humans and creatures of those realities would be destroyed as well. Was murdering countless other beings worth it to protect their own reality? O5-1 begins to shake. He hasn't slept or eaten anything since his talk with Desmond. He's being torn apart from the inside. O5-3 stands up and addresses the Council. He informs everyone in the room that independent teams have concluded research into what the Calvin Desmond entity has claimed, and they found it to be true. The world really would come to an end. Furthermore, 
the research teams determined that the capabilities of Desmond would in fact allow him to dismantle the other realities. O5-3 insists that the Council must vote to allow Desmond to destroy the other realities to ensure that this reality could be saved. They must strike now before the world is overrun. O5-1 continues to shake while O5-3 breathes heavily, sweat pouring down his temples. The rest of the Council shifts their gazes from side to side. It is time for a vote. There are eight eyes to allow Desmond to destroy all other realities and four nays against the plan. O5-3 stands up and walks around the room, stopping behind each nay voter and putting a bullet in their head. He stops at the last, O5-9, who pulls out a gun, places it under her own chin, and pulls the trigger. O5-13 abstains from the vote and the measure passes. The remaining overseers will use the Calvin Desmond entity to save their reality at the expense of all others, and they soon head to Area 11 to execute their plan. O5-1, 4, and 12 enter the observation room that looks upon the swirling radioactive gas around Calvin Desmond. O5-1 orders Netzak to begin powering down the array which will allow the entity to prove he can do what he has promised. They have pinpointed the reality that SCP-884 came from, and the shaving mirror itself sits on a table in another room in the facility. O5-3 stands in the room, watching the mirror to see if anything happens. O5-1 asks Calvin Desmond to eliminate the reality that the mirror had come from. The room shakes as the entity uses it to acknowledge the request. Moments later, the phone rings in the observation room. It is O5-3. He informs the others that the mirror has disappeared. Its reality has been destroyed, and therefore, it no longer exists. There is a sigh of relief in the room as the overseers realize that this just might work. O5-1 asks Calvin Desmond to continue and destroy all the realities that are bleeding into their own. This time, the entire facility begins to quake. Suddenly, O5-1 jerks backwards. His eyes wide in confusion and horror. His body seems to be compressing under an unknown force. O5-1 begins to distort. His legs and arms fold into the core of his body. His head snaps down, and all that was O5-1 is sucked down into a single point in space before it completely disappears. Calvin Desmond then turns his attention to the other two overseers in the room, who both seem to collapse into black holes of their own in the center of their bodies. Netzak's warning klaxon begins to sound, signaling that the emergency failsafe has been activated. Before Calvin Desmond is brought under control, the structural support in the entire facility vibrates with his words. They are in a voice that sounds strangely similar to O51's. Your children are free to live lives that do not end in horror. An end to your perpetual struggle. An end to darkness. The freedom to live in the light. All traces must be removed. This world must be washed clean. The Foundation does not escape atonement. It is the only way out. It had been a deception. The Calvin Desmond entity had no intention of stopping anomalies from infiltrating this world. It wanted to remove all traces of the anomalies from all universes, including this one and that meant destroying the Overseers and the Foundation itself. Their destruction would serve as an atonement for the pain and suffering they had caused in their quest to secure and contain the Anomalous. Calvin had to lie to the Overseers about the real plan, since he knew they'd never sacrifice themselves and the Foundation, even if it meant an end to the Anomalies plaguing our world. Now though, with the Overseers out of the way, the Calvin Desmond entity is free to move forward with its plan and purge all realities of any trace of the Anomalous. But just then, Netzak's failsafes kick in and the Petrakal Fountain Spatial Stabilization Array subdues the entity's abilities. Desmond is once again contained. O5-3 bursts through the door and into the observation room. He stands before the shattered glass of the window that looks into the array. O53 asks Netzak how long the containment array can hold Calvin Desmet. The computer's voice fades in and out, but says, Given current conditions, 119 days, 6 hours, and 47 minutes. O5-3 sighs. He tells Netzak to make a note in the SCP database that the Calvin Desmet entity will now be known as SCP-001. 
then to make dozens of other randomly generated entries and label them as SCP-001 as well. He knows that they will need to keep the true nature of what this entity can do a secret. O5-3 walks out of the room. Under his breath, he speaks to himself. They'll say that I'll know the one true god when I see it, and to give that god everything it wants, because that's the only thing that matters. Tonight, it appears god wants to talk to me. You can attempt to flee. You can try your best to hide. You might even valiantly try to fight back. But when the bloody dawn of the Scarlet King finally stretches across the multiverse's collective horizon, there will be almost nothing that we can do. Every sadistic monster, every world-ending horror, every dimension-transcending malicious reality warper, none of them even begin to approach the danger and pure undiluted evil of the Crimson Khan himself. We've covered this horrific eldritch entity in several videos before, from his SCP-001 proposal to the potential SCP identities of his hellish spawn, to the earthly vectors of those children, the horrifying SCP-231. But today we're not interested in once again going over how the SCP Foundation feels about their greatest enemy. That's only one side of the story. Today, we're going to explore the origins of the Scarlet King through the cold, dark eyes of a very different source, his very first earthly worshippers. It all began with the Davites. We've discussed this extinct culture before on this channel in passing, but to fully understand how we know the cursed information we're imparting today, we first need to understand exactly who the Davites are and why they were such a terrifying society. We're not talking about a mere group of interest here, like the Serpent's Hand or the Chaos Insurgency. We're talking about an imperialistic, militarist civilization that brought pain, terror, and suffering to everyone and everything they encountered. The Davite culture was arranged into a series of dense, urban city-states that supported themselves through brutal slave labor, farmed from their own people and weaker groups that they conquered through extremely hostile takeovers. The name Davites is derived from the culture's ruling class, the Devas, powerful and potentially immortal sorcerers who maintained their abilities through ritualistic torture, sacrifice, and cannibalism. Much of what we know about these monsters is derived from a cursed book titled A Chronicle of the Devas, designated by the Foundation as SCP-140, an incomplete chronicle. Much like its subjects, the book is bloodthirsty. Ink or human blood spilled around the book will be stolen and incorporated into text on its sordid pages. That would be ominous enough, but it gets much worse. As editions of the book are revised through these sanguine updates, the book literally revises the history of the real world, moving the extinction date of the Davites just that much closer. The book is one of the Foundation's most closely guarded anomalies because if enough revisions are made that the Davite culture enters recent history, or even worse, the present day, it would mean the end of the world as we know it. In all likelihood, the lucky ones among us would be killed or written out of history immediately. The rest would become slaves to the Devas, or become victims to their occult bloodlust. After finding out all this about these horrifying people, it really shouldn't come as a surprise to you that they're some of the first recorded worshippers of the Scarlet King in our dimension. You'd have trouble finding a more perfect representation of the King's philosophy around pain, cruelty, subjugation, and a world ruled by primitive violence. That brings us to what we can learn about the king himself from artifacts left behind by his first and most ardent followers. A collection of tablets that act as a kind of sacred, holy creation myth for the Scarlet King and his gruesome pantheon was discovered at a Foundation-sponsored Davite dig site. And using other Davite sources, these tablets were translated into a harrowing account known only as Dust and Blood. Between the darkness below and the darkness above, at the beginning of all things, the Tree of Life was planted. This was the moment when all things across the multiverse were given form. Life and death began, expansion and entropy, order and chaos. And out of all of that, a cast of elder gods were also born into the vast and quivering dark. Many of their names have been lost to the pages of history, but one that was not was a being known only as Kaharok. Kaharok was born into humble beginnings. He and his forgotten siblings roiled in the abyss, the only thing separating him from everything else being the very awareness that he was struck down in the abyss. 
He was both blessed and cursed with self-awareness in a void filled with ignorant darkness. He felt the sting of loneliness, pain, and resentment. And if existence was such pain, what was the point of existing at all? In fact, what was the point of anyone or anything existing if they were all just doomed to this dull suffering? At this moment, Kahrok found his calling, bringing about the end of everything. But first, he needed strength. To achieve this, he devoured his brothers and sisters in the abyss, stealing their strength and their essence. This is known as the first sin of Kahrok, and he was punished accordingly with even greater pain as he grew. And of course, this did nothing but strengthen his resolve. Blinded by pain, fury, and pure hatred, he vowed to uproot and destroy the very tree of life itself for putting him through this awfulness. This was Kahrok's first bloody conquest. He clawed his way up to his throne, slaying and devouring countless other elder gods over eons of brutality and war. Some were allowed to live for showing loyalty to Kahrok, and they would amass great power under him. But it would only ever be under him. He was beginning to form what would later become his legion of terrifying supernatural warriors and servants. When his conquest of the lower realms of creation was complete, he gave himself the title of King of the Darkness Below. He also took the name Kinthigor to reflect his new position. His kingdom of absolute cruelty and despair would claim the souls of anyone unlucky enough to stray too close, and put them through the suffering that Kinthigor had so resented. But his work wasn't done, he was just getting started. The King of the Darkness below declared all-out war on the rest of creation, opening the floodgates and releasing his terrifying forces on the surrounding kingdoms. Their operations were the template for the Davite way of warfare and life. They would conquer and destroy, and force the survivors into servitude. Anyone who dared defy the orders of the king would be broken and destroyed. His word was law, and the law was absolute. At some point during the expansion of his empire, Kinthigor enslaved a wise and beautiful goddess known as Sana, or the mother of those beneath us. She detested the king and his seemingly limitless barbarism, but she was smart enough to follow his orders and feign loyalty to ensure her continued survival in the short term. This, however, would not ensure her safety forever. Kinthigor had no intention of ruling and conquering alone. He wished to create an evil dynasty to rule underneath him and carry out his every command across the multiverse. He decided that Sana would be his first bride and forebearer to the first generation of his spawn. She was made to lay with him for seven days and seven nights so that she could give birth to seven children, seven being a highly significant number in the world of sorcery and particularly in the world of Kinthigor. Once Sana had served this purpose, Kinthigor, who could not feel anything even close to love, had no more use for her, and crushed her to death. When he rose up from this grisly deed, his armor was covered in Sana's blood. This striking image inspired his final name, Shormash Urdal, the Scarlet King. From Sana, the Scarlet King gained seven daughters, who in an act of further monstrosity, he also made his seven brides. Each gave birth to a legion of nightmares, which would become the Scarlet King's most loyal and dangerous soldiers. The Scarlet King also gave each of these brides a secret seal, so that they would never die. The first bride was Ativik, who was the favorite of the Scarlet King despite having the smallest brood. She and her children were granted great wisdom that would guide them to victory in battle. Her seal was Vaduk, Dominion. The second bride was Agor, born with a great hole in her soul that left her forever in want. However, she gave birth to a huge legion, who then begot even greater armies to go forth and conquer in the name of their terrible grandfather. Her seal was Kiffin, Longing. The third bride was Adistat, a creature of unparalleled malice and hatred that extended to even her own sisters. She and her brood were unmatched in their ability to spread desolation, destruction, and pestilence on the battlefield. Her seal was Hezhum, Desolation. The fourth bride was Ezieb, a great berserker if ever there was one. She took the form of a huge beast as did all her children. They would rampage through enemy forces, killing scores of soldiers yet seemingly impervious to all damage dealt against them. Her seal was Ba, Wrath. The fifth bride was Anat, a beast with a frail body but an incredible mind. Her children all proved to be adept sorcerers, with the ability to craft and rework reality however they pleased. 
This would prove to be a great asset to the Scarlet King, but he also feared that their powers would allow them to rebel against him, and so he had them all crippled. Her seal was Nair, black. The sixth bride was Atalif, the most silent and secretive of all the Scarlet siblings. Her children had the remarkable ability to change their faces and walk unnoticed amongst their enemies. They also had the ability to open the ways between worlds, allowing the Scarlet King's endless war to spread across dimensions. Her seal was Ushek, hidden. And the seventh and final bride was Ahibat, who was physically the weakest of them all but the only one with the strength of spirit to disagree with and rebel against her father's diabolical wishes. Her children were brave warriors and hunters, many of which are aligned with her mission to stop the dreaded Scarlet King. Though thus far none have yet achieved this lofty mission, her seal was Oxkib, Hope. As the Scarlet King's power grew, more of the multiverse fell into his poisonous clutches, rotting the very roots of the Tree of Life. As the Seven Brides and their legions spread out, they recruited more cosmic players for their grand war effort. The Hanged King pledged his allegiance. The Prince of Many Faces swore his loyalty to the Scarlet King. The demonic forces of the factory worked in the name of the Unholy Monarch, and the Horned Demon Lord Moloch bowed his mighty head. The Davites firmly believed that the victory of their almighty Scarlet King was as certain as the sunset. No matter what opposes him, be it the Serpent, the Broken God, the arrogant fools like the SCP Foundation, he and his forces will fight on. They will tear the Tree of Life asunder, carving away at everything until nothing remains. Existence will be at its end and the last sound the multiverse hears will be the Scarlet King himself sighing in relief after a job well done. He will finally be at peace. Unless, of course, somebody stops him. If the best minds the Foundation has to offer, with all of its resources and knowledge and connections, are able to create some kind of weapon or shield against him. If SCP-999 truly is the child of Ahabat, prophesized to bring about the end of the Scarlet King's terrible conquest, if there is some unknown solution waiting out there in the dark, we may finally be able to stop this rampaging Elder God from destroying all we hold dear. But those are all very big ifs. Calvin Lucian leads the Kill Squad team through the mud and freezing rain. In front of them looms the fortress of Baron Lehman Hoadley, the eighth overseer. The team has already been through a lot from breaking the Overseer Council's deal with death by eliminating O5-13, to using the Spear of the Non-Believer to kill the godlike Archivist, O5-10. The hunting of Overseers has taken a toll on the Kill Squad. O5-12 almost killed Adam, and Olivia was stuck in what seemed like an endless mind game with O5-11. The first five Overseers were eliminated, but the words that the ninth Overseer spoke to Calvin Lucian before she died still run through his mind. Are you afraid of death? Now the Kill Squad is about to infiltrate one of the most heavily guarded facilities in the world to eliminate the 8th Overseer. Upon reaching the castle, the team is surprised to find the structure is in ruin. No one is supposed to know the location of 05-8 though. The fortress was supposed to be practically impregnable. They storm the castle of 05-8 all the same. The journal Calvin possesses that contains information about the members of the SCP Foundation's powerful O5 Council identifies him as a former industrialist named Baron Lehman Hoadley. With his vast wealth, Hoadley funded the Foundation at the start and was considered the unofficial leader of the Council in its early days with immense control over the actions of the organization. The Kill Squad makes their way through the dimly lit hallways of the castle. As they turn the corner, they are surprised to find the charred remains of Baron Lehman Hoadley's bodyguards. It seems that someone or something has gotten to Hoadley before they could. The team makes their way to the main chamber and breaches the door. Laying by a still lit fireplace is O5-8. The Kill Squad scans the room to make sure the killer isn't still in there with them. Adam walks over to the body and examines it. He quickly realizes that Hoadley hasn't been murdered at all. He sees that Baron Hoadley's body has been drastically modified using anomalous technology. The Overseer used his immortality to modify almost every part of his body to make himself stronger. Unfortunately for Baron Hoadley, when the Overseer's deal with death was broken by Calvin, the modifications to his body slowly tore him apart. 
His regular body could no longer support all the modifications, and what once made him practically invincible became the very thing that destroyed him. The team leaves the castle and crosses 05-8 off their list. On their way out, Adam pulls Calvin aside. He has the feeling that Anthony hasn't been completely honest with the rest of the team. He had the feeling that Anthony was hiding something from them. Calvin had similar thoughts recently. He pushes Anthony for more information about his past, and Anthony reveals that he's over 100 years old. The vial of water from the Fountain of Youth that Calvin has was not the only one. Early in his career with the insurgency, he had confiscated other vials from a Foundation site. His squad drank the water and it extended their lives. He asks Calvin on what he plans on doing with his water from the fountain. I'm going to destroy it, Calvin tells him. Anthony agrees with this plan. Once you drink from the Fountain of Youth, you may extend your life, but a part of you dies at the same time. Vibrancy of the senses disappears, leading to a seemingly shallow life. If Anthony could go back and do it again, he never would have drank the water. Calvin receives intel from the insurgency that the seventh overseer is in a small town in Cambodia. The kill squad makes their way to the village and surveys the area, hoping to get a glimpse at the overseer who is codenamed Green. As the team conducts reconnaissance, Anthony tells them that he thinks the mission is a setup. It is too remote, and there are so many unknown variables. But Calvin is convinced that this might be their only chance to kill Green. Since Green arrived in the area, there has been non-stop chaos. She has destabilized the local governments, and now the area is in an all-out war. The team weaves through narrow passageways between houses and buildings, trying to make their way to the central compound where Green is located. Suddenly, a mob starts to form. They are getting closer and closer to the team. In a quick decision to avoid being seen, Calvin orders everyone into a nearby building. Before Anthony can follow, the mob rounds the corner. They spot Anthony, and he's forced to flee. Calvin, Olivia, and Adam watch as the mob chases after Anthony, but they have to keep moving. Calvin knows that Anthony can take care of himself, and they are too close to their goal to stop now. Calvin slowly opens the front door of the house they are hiding in and peers out. The coast looks clear, so he signals Olivia and Adam to follow him. Before they can step out into the street, a gas canister enters through a cracked doorway. The room fills with sleeping gas and the team passes out. When they are awake, they are tied up in a large room with marble vaulted ceilings. 05-7 is standing in front of Calvin. She smiles wickedly while holding a knife. She compliments Calvin on what he and his team have been able to do so far. No one believed they could pull off even a fraction of what they have. But now she has an offer for Calvin. She points towards Adam and Olivia and tells Calvin he must choose one of them to die. If he doesn't, she'll kill the leader of the rioters and plunge another part of the country into chaos. Screw you, is Calvin's response. Very well, utters Green. Have it your way. She assassinates the leader being held in her compound, then turns back to Calvin. She now threatens to torture his team until Calvin makes a choice of who to kill. Green slashes Adam's cheek with her knife as Calvin screams for Green to leave his team alone and torture him instead. Green just smiles. I'm going to enjoy killing your friends while you watch, as you have killed so many of my overseers on the council. She reaches up in the air with the knife above Adam's head. Before she can plunge the knife through his skull, a bullet passes through her hand, causing her to drop the knife. Anthony kneels on a rooftop across the courtyard, smoking sniper rifles still pointed at Green, who runs. Calvin uses the dropped knife to cut his ropes and chases after Green. He follows her to the roof where he watches as she boards a helicopter. The aircraft lifts off as Anthony fires at it from his original position, but does no serious damage. In the plaza below, the mob that has separated the team earlier becomes restless. There is complete chaos and someone fires a rocket at the fleeing helicopter. The rocket hits the tail of the aircraft, sending it crashing into the plaza full of rioters below as the crowd flees from the scene. Calvin makes his way towards the wreckage and reaches it at the same time Anthony does. Calvin looks at him, smiles, and thanks him for saving his life. Anthony smiles back, but before he can say anything, a gunshot rings out and a bullet rips through his neck. Calvin turns to see where it came from and is horrified to see the burning body of 05-7. Her skin has been charred black, but in her burnt hand she holds a gun. What's left of her lips curl back in a sinister grin as she fires again and hits Anthony in the chest. 
Rocky falls to the ground. Kelvin runs to him and pulls out his gun to shoot 05-7, but she is already dead. Calvin holds his dying teammate as blood pours out of his neck and chest, but Calvin can stop this. He pulls out the vial of water from the fountain. No, winces Anthony, I have lived long enough. Thank you, my friend. I will see you in whatever lies beyond this life. Anthony's chest rises, then falls. It does not rise again. Olivia and Adam round the corner to see Calvin holding the lifeless body of their teammate, tears flowing from his eyes. The team holds a small ceremony and burial for Anthony, but are only halfway through their mission and can't stop now. They fly back to the United States, where an undercover insurgency agent named Kowalski informs them that 05-6 is already aware they are after him. This overseer is codenamed the American because he has the power of the entire US military at his fingertips. The Kill Squad scouts the base where the American is located. Kowalski warns them of a crate that was recently brought to the base from Site-19. The Americans showed great interest in whatever was in the container. The group sets up a camp on a hill overlooking the base. As the sun slowly rises the next day, the Kill Squad is spotted by a drone and forced to hop in their jeep and try to run. They make their way down the hill, finding themselves in the valley below with no clear exit. In front of them lands a helicopter as Humvees roar into the canyon behind them. The team is surrounded. A jeep pulls up and 05-6 steps out. He introduces himself as Rufus King, member of the Overseer Council, but an American citizen first and foremost. All he really wants is to protect the country he loves. Thanks to you, I've lost my immortality and can no longer effectively protect the United States anymore, the American says to Calvin but I'm willing to make a deal. Your freedom for the spear of the non-believer. Rumor has it that you have the spear in your possession and you used it to kill the archivist. If you give me the spear, I will let you go. No, replies Calvin. I will never give an overseer the means to cause more destruction. The spear stays with us. Very well, the American says with a frown. Then I suppose my only other option is to take it from you but not without giving you a fair chance. Run, Calvin Lucian. Run as fast as you can. I will be coming for you. The American turns and walks towards the container from Site-19, which is being lowered from a helicopter hovering above them. Calvin sprints back to the Jeep with the other members of his team. As they drive away, they hear a horrible, guttural screech from whatever was inside the container. After a few moments, the army begins to pursue them. Out in front of the military force is 05-6 riding SCP-682. He is using a black whip to urge the creature forward, and they're gaining on the kill squad. Fast. A row of vehicles pulls up beside the American and SCP-682. Then something strange happens. A man appears in front of the oncoming forces led by the American. The man's skin bulges and seems to be moving from within. The skin of the man slouse from his body. The infection that is SCP-610 erupts out of him and onto the soldiers in the nearby jeep. SCP-610 begins to infect and consume everyone around it. Suddenly, there are thousands of instances of SCP-610 coming from the mountainside, flooding into the valley. They close in and around the army and 05-6. The American begins fighting off the flesh-eating creatures from the back of SCP-682, but he becomes overwhelmed. He can no longer focus on pursuing Calvin and his team. From the back of the jeep, Olivia pulls out her rifle. She aims and fires. The bullet hits the American in the chest. He is flung off the back of SCP-682 and engulfed in a sea of SCP-610 creatures. The kill squad continues to drive, trying to put as much distance between themselves and the SCP-610 infestation as possible. But then Calvin suddenly slams on the brake. Standing in front of them is a man in a black suit and bow tie. He introduces himself as Blackbird, the fifth overseer. According to the journal, his actual name is Mortimer J. Denning von Krocknicker. He stands in front of the jeep with a menacing grin. You have been causing a lot of trouble, he says looking at Calvin. Olivia swings her gun around. Oh, please my dear, that won't help you, von Krocknicker says. He pulls out a knife and stabs himself through the neck. He falls to the ground, apparently dead. There is a gust of wind. A whiff of ozone, 
and an identical copy and still very much alive on Krocknicker lands next to his own dead body. See what I mean? He says. Olivia lowers her rifle. Come with me, I have something to show you. The blackbird beckons. Seeing no other option, Calvin, Olivia, and Adam exit the jeep and follow the blackbird. As they walk, the world changes around them. The desert mountains fade away into blackness and find themselves in a near-apocalyptic London. Oh, it's good to be home, the blackbird says as they emerge onto a cobblestone street. You cannot stop the overseer's plans. However, I can give you an alternative. Let's see if any of you will take it. In front of each Kill Squad member appears a door. They have an uncontrollable urge to open their respective door and walk through. The Blackbird stands smiling as he watches Calvin, Olivia, and Adam enter each of their portals. Adam enters his door and looks around. He is in Portland. His parents walk into the room. In this universe, his family has been granted asylum. Adam never has to interact with any SCPs or the Foundation. He is free to live a normal life. From the kitchen comes Calvin wearing an apron. He is holding a steaming pot. Adam locks eyes with Calvin, who smiles at him. The blackbird whispers into Adam's ear. In this reality, both of your parents and siblings are still alive. Also, the man you love loves you back. You and Calvin could be married if you stayed here. Wouldn't that be nice? Olivia enters her door. She is on the deck of a yacht. At the bow sits an easel with art supplies. The man that Olivia once loved walks across the deck towards her. The blackbird looms over her. In this reality, you didn't accidentally kill him. This could be your happily ever after. Wouldn't that be nice? Calvin steps through his door. He is in a grassy clearing near a lake. The blackbird hisses in Calvin's ear. I'm giving you the opportunity to save your mother this time, Calvin. You were just a scared little boy. But in this reality, you can be brave. You can actually save your mother from her fate. No! Calvin screams. This isn't real! The blackbird cackles. Calvin looks away from the lake and towards the tree line. Hidden in the shadows, he can just barely make out a hooded figure. Calvin walks towards it. The blackbird follows. He is screaming at the person in the tree line. I was only trying to help! The hooded figure reaches out and hands Calvin a metal tube. He opens it to find a set of eyeglasses inside. Calvin puts them on and turns to look at the blackbird. He steps back in horror. The glasses have revealed the true form of the blackbird. He is a winged pseudo-avian monstrosity full of rage. The mysterious hooded figure directs Calvin to open the tube again. Inside is an interdimensional fishing line made by Dr. Wondertainment and a white wiffle ball bat. Calvin grabs the fishing line and wraps it around 05-5's leg. The blackbird flies into the air trying to get away from Calvin, but Calvin wraps the other end of the fishing line around his arm. The blackbird begins to jump from dimension to dimension trying to get rid of Calvin. They appear on the deck of SCP-455, in Site-19 where SCP-682 walks freely, in the dead world of SCP-2935. Every time they stop in a new dimension, Calvin takes the opportunity to attack the blackbird with the bat, and it seems that he is slowly weakening the monster. They finally land at the bottom of a deep well foundation containment site, where the dark body that is SCP-001 is contained. Standing in front of the containment field is Allison Cho, the Black Queen, whose sole mission is to destroy the foundation. You! cries the blackbird. You are the one who has been helping Lucian! The Black Queen nods her head. Yes, I have been helping Calvin Lucian to eliminate you and the other overseers. The Foundation must fall. You are nothing! You cannot stop me! I am the Black King! Screams 05-5. Allison Chow sighs. She pushes a button on the panel next to her, shutting down the array containing the dark body. Out of the cloud of dust appears SCP-001, a massive black creature who seemed to absorb all light. No, stop! shrieks the blackbird. SCP-001 does not move, but the room begins to shake. The blackbird continues to scream as his body folds in on itself, until he is reduced to a single superheated point, and then blinks out of existence. Allison Chow then reactivates the containment array, sealing 001 away once again. I will return you to your reality along with your friends, says the Black Queen. 
But perhaps our paths shall cross again, Calvin Lucian. There is a bright flash of light, and Calvin finds himself on a private jet sitting next to Olivia and Adam. They are all shaken, but the Blackbird is dead. 05-5 has been eliminated. The three members of the team sit silently, still pondering what might have been if they stayed in the alternate realities. Suddenly, the phone on the plane begins to ring, breaking the silence. Calvin picks it up. On the other line is the fourth overseer. He has contacted Calvin to discuss surrendering to the insurgency. Unfortunately, things do not always go as planned. Calvin Lucian is about to make the most difficult and dangerous decision of his life. It was 1948 in Villa Blanca, Guatemala. As night fell, two young boys, Carlos and Miguel, played a game of soccer in the street. It was a quiet town full of humble, hard-working people, and they were about to come face to face with a monster. Typically, when something like this happened, you'd know exactly who to call, the SCP Foundation. Problem is, while these days we can generally depend on the hard-working agents and researchers of the Foundation to save us from any anomalous supernatural threats with their tactics, expertise, and equipment, it wasn't always this way. There was a time before the SCP Foundation became the titan of anomaly combating prowess it is today. And it's that time that we're focusing on today. It all comes back to a strange and violent creature wandering the darkened streets of Guatemala. Or, as Dr. Charles Ogden Gears proposed, we call it, SCP-001, the prototype. SCP-001 is a topic that we've covered in a number of videos, but even then we can never quite capture the full scope of this Wiley designation. What is SCP-001 is probably one of the most loaded questions you can possibly ask a member of the SCP Foundation, and it may be your last. As the majority of the files under the SCP-001 umbrella are highly classified for pretty much everyone under level 5 clearance. 001 covers a large number of potentially anomalous items, entities, and concepts, from the dreaded Scarlet King to the awe-inspiring Gate Guardian, to the very SCP Foundation itself, through the eyes of the charmingly incompetent Unusual Incidents Unit of the FBI. Perhaps they're all real, perhaps only one of them is, and the rest are in there as a smokescreen. Perhaps they're all fake, red herrings laid down to hide the trail to something even more secretive and fantastic. All we know is that 001 seemed to be gathered around a collection of loose themes. The beginnings of the Foundation, events or entities that could end the Foundation or even the world, and key formative moments in the Foundation's history. Dr. Gear's proposal for SCP-001 lies firmly in the latter camp, and if you keep watching and listening closely, you'll see exactly why. Back to Carlos and Miguel, the pair of 11-year-olds playing football on the quiet back streets of Villa Blanca. They were kicking the ball back and forth when they heard a strange screeching noise in the distance. At first they thought it was some kind of injured bird, squawking desperately for help. Being good kids, they didn't waste a second running into the action, heading further into the outskirts of town. However, the creature they encountered on that rural road was certainly no bird. When they first saw it hunched over a few meters in front of them, they thought it must have been a horribly injured man. He was deadly thin, with gray-brown skin that looked either bruised or burned. It was twitching and weeping, its chest heaving in heavy labored pants. Its limbs were jerking wildly, as though the creature was being electrocuted. Hey mister, are you okay? Carlos called out in Spanish. In that moment, what they had wrongly thought was a man just froze up, finally registering their presence. Immediately, the two boys knew something was wrong, as the creature slowly rose to its full height, well over six feet, towering over the two of them, even at a distance. They noticed something was wrong with its limbs. They were too long, well out of proportion with its human-sized torso. It didn't have hands and feet, at least not in the way that humans do. Instead, its slender ankles terminated in long black spikes, and its wrists each split off into three equally black claws. But worst of all was its face, if you could even call what that monster had a face. Its head was split in the middle by a huge mouth. At first, its gnarly lips were pursed, but they soon slid open with a low, rumbling roar. 
The boys could feel their knees shaking as they saw the monster's mouthful of long, rotten fangs. Something started sliding up the dark passage of the monster's throat. A translucent, milky blue sphere. Was that thing an eye? It made the two boys feel sick to even look at it. That's when the eye started to glow, and the space around the monster began to shimmer slightly, like some kind of terrible sorcery. As the two boys felt a strange force pulling at them, trying to tug them into the creature's embrace, they were suddenly jogged from their frightened paralysis and decided to finally make a run for it. There was no doubt about what had just happened. They'd encountered a demon in the flesh, intent on taking their souls straight to hell. When the two of them told their parents, they were met at first with disbelief. Two young boys saw something that frightened them in the dark, perhaps an animal, if anything at all, and they would let their imaginations run wild. It was typical of children, however things didn't seem quite so simple when more sightings started popping up. People all across the town of Villa Blanca started seeing this monster, all with matching descriptions. A huge, emaciated beast with a mouth for a face, its glowing blue eye nested inside. The natural excuses circulated at first. Perhaps the creature was a local prankster in a costume. This would be comforting to believe, but how many pranksters in costumes can completely disappear before your very eyes? The monster's eye would glow, and just like that, it would simply vanish. As fear and paranoia began spreading through the town, people suggested that perhaps it was a case of mass hysteria, fear and panic taking over rationality. But by this point, things had gotten worse. Carlos and Miguel, the two boys who'd first discovered the demon on the back road, had become sick. They were experiencing severe nausea, vomiting, headaches, and diarrhea. Their bodies weakened. Lesions began developing on their skin. As their conditions deteriorated, and it seemed as though nobody was capable of treating them, a rumor spread that the monster was somehow inducing this sickness. The town doctor didn't have the expertise to diagnose it, but the boys were suffering from acute radiation sickness. And they wouldn't be the only ones. Many of the people who'd reported sightings and close encounters with the monster started coming down with severe radiation sickness. To the townspeople, it just seemed to be a demon spreading some invisible plague among them. But the horrors wouldn't stop there. It seemed that this demon also liked to take a more direct approach to harming the townsfolk, because not long after the sickness broke out, people started disappearing. There were never any bodies. The most that would ever be found were tattered items of clothing left at the site of the disappearances, or blood smeared across the walls or ground. Before they knew it, seven of their people were gone. It seemed that, for all intents and purposes, God had abandoned them. They were playthings of the demon now. Thankfully for the townsfolk who weren't yet irradiated or vanished, an organization was forming, one that might be their only chance at salvation. Someday in the future, it would become known as the SCP Foundation, but it had a lot to learn before it got there. You see, the reason that this iteration of SCP-001 is known as the prototype is that, if Dr. Gears is to be believed, it may be the first anomalous entity that they ever truly faced. So naturally, getting the creature captured and contained didn't go quite as smoothly as most of their modern jobs, despite the comparative simplicity of this old threat. General Machoy, an ex-military operator that became part of what we'll once again call the Precursors to the Foundation, led a research and recovery team into Villa Blanca to hunt down and retrieve the beast that had been causing all this misery and death among the townsfolk. However, this proved to be easier said than done. While its bestial appearance might fool people into thinking the monster was just a mindless animal, later writings on the creature would describe it as both incredibly cunning and terrifyingly fast. When a group of armed personnel first tried to engage the creature directly, they had no idea that they were walking right into the middle of a bloodbath. They believed they had it surrounded on another rural back road, advancing with assault rifles, when the creature flipped out and started killing them. The prototype proved to have frightening offensive capabilities. Its three dark claws easily carved through the armor of the soldiers trying desperately to contain it. The creature moved so fast that none of them could reliably draw a bead on it, and if any of them could, 
It was holding their severed head before they had a chance to squeeze the trigger. But death by the creature's claws was one of the more pleasant ways it could kill its victims. At one point during an engagement with Precursor troops, it opened its mouth and unveiled its glowing blue eye. At this point, one of the soldiers screamed and suddenly seemed to be sucked inside of himself, completely disappearing. The prototype's blue eye glowed again, and it once again just teleported away from the scene. A number of soldiers who survived this altercation later needed to be treated for acute radiation sickness. Researchers eventually managed to figure out what was actually happening with the creature. It had the ability to manifest micro-singularities, tiny black holes that it used to both teleport from place to place and defend itself from attacks when necessary. These singularities wouldn't stick around for long, a few seconds at most, but they had the terrifying side effect of putting out massive amounts of radiation. This is why it was making so much of the town and the recovery team sick via mere proximity. Thankfully, in finding out the creature's strength, they also managed to find out its weaknesses. Its powers were dampened by high humidity, bright lights, and especially intense strobing lights. It was through the use of these lights that the creature was finally captured and brought into ADRX-19, a complex that would later become Site-19 for containment. There, its containment procedures were devised by one of the burgeoning organization's top minds, Dr. Herman Ketter. However, Dr. Ketter would sadly never actually live to see the duration of the prototype's containment at ADRX-19. He was tragically killed by the monster, though his name would live on as the designation for anomalies that were particularly difficult to contain. It was thanks to him that his co-workers realized lead-lined walls, a reinforced steel door, a 100% humidity environment, and the frequent application of high-intensity strobe lights were the best way to keep the prototype locked up for good. To this day, this iteration of SCP-001 is a fascinating reminder that the SCP Foundation wasn't always the juggernaut it is today. There was once a time where they had as little idea of what they were doing as the rest of us. There's no better representation of this than the file itself. It was an era before object classes and conventional designation numbers. The file is written in a sketchy, disorganized manner and arranged into item designation number, warning, description of item, detail of current containment, report, and addendum. As with any experience in life, it's always worth asking, what can we learn from the SCP Foundation's experience with its possible first anomaly, a monster that seems almost nostalgically quaint by today's standards? Perhaps the greatest message is that everything is a work in progress. It was only by determination and persistence that the Foundation could go from an organization challenged by a monster like the Prototype to going toe-to-toe -to -toe with real heavy hitters like the Scarlet King. How very inspirational. Aaron Siegel, better known to Foundation members as O5-1, descends into the abyss of a Deepwell site. He exits the elevator and peers into the optical scanner to unlock the reinforced door. Inside the room is Mobile Task Force Tau-5, Samsara. Aaron Siegel refers to these immortal cyborg clones created from the flesh of a dead god as his red right hand. Your mission is to eliminate the traitor 05-4 and to find the insurgents who have been killing the members of the Overseer Council. The cyborgs stand at attention. Now! Aaron Siegel screams. The soldiers of the Red Right Hand march out the door to start their mission. Aaron Siegel pauses for a moment and then slams his fist against the wall in frustration. He has lost nine overseers to Calvin Lucian and his Kill Squad team. They have been somehow overcoming the odds each time and eliminating each overseer they track down. It wasn't supposed to end this way. Aaron Siegel vows to kill them all. Calvin Lucian, meanwhile, sits on a private jet with Adam and Olivia. He had just hung up the phone after a conversation with O5-4. The overseer known as the Ambassador wants to surrender to the insurgency. There's a good chance this is a trap, but Calvin has decided to meet with the Ambassador all the same. Calvin drops off Adam and Olivia at an insurgency base. They still haven't fully recovered from the previous mission with O5-5, known as the Blackbird. Before leaving, though, Calvin meets with an insurgency agent named Sylvester Sloan, who is going to join him as support. Calvin says goodbye to Adam and Olivia, then leaves with Sloan to meet the ambassador in South Africa. After landing at Johannesburg Airport, Calvin and Sloan disembark and are led to a conference room where the ambassador sits waiting for them. Calvin and Sloan sit across from O5-4 to discuss his surrender. 
the council is in shambles, says the ambassador. Everything is falling apart. I want to offer my services and information to the insurgency in exchange for protection from 05-1. He's lost his mind. Calvin agrees to the terms and prepares for extraction. But as they get up from the table, gunshots can be heard from down the hall. The ambassador's eyes open wide in terror. It's too late, he whispers. Calvin and Sloane grab the ambassador, who is frozen in fear, and exit the conference room. They make their way towards their plane, but the gunshots are getting closer. Calvin looks over his shoulder to see Samsara pursuing them through the terminal. Calvin shoves the ambassador behind a table as bullets whiz overhead. Calvin and Sloane return fire, but their volley doesn't seem to slow down the assassins. Calvin and Sloane pull the ambassador to his feet, and they burst through an emergency exit onto the sun-baked tarmac where they make a mad dash for the plane. From behind them, a bullet rips through the chest of Sloane. The red right hand has caught up, but Calvin continues to drag the ambassador towards the plane. They are almost there. Suddenly, a metallic child's voice blares through the airport's external speakers. The child's voice says, I want Calvin Lucien alive. I have business to settle with him. The red right hand soldiers tackle Calvin and the ambassador to the ground when they are just feet away from the plane. Kill the traitor, the child's voice says, and Calvin can only watch helplessly as the ambassador is violently murdered. One of the agents turns towards Calvin and slams his fist into Calvin's face, causing him to black out. Calvin awakes in a dark room. He is unsure how much time has passed. The only light in the room comes from a screen on the wall. In the middle of the screen is a rotating red SCP Foundation seal. A voice from a speaker speaks. Hello, Calvin Lucian. My name is The Kid. I am the third overseer. You have killed all my friends, and now I will kill all of yours. The door to the room opens. Calvin leans through the doorway. There is a long, dimly lit hallway. The Kid orders him to proceed so they can meet face to face. As Calvin walks, the Kid's voice echoes down the hallway. There once was another 05-3. He built incredible machines even one that could see into the future. But unfortunately for him, he did not have the passion required to be an overseer. That was when I was… born. I was chosen by the other overseers to have my spinal cord severed in a way that gave me the ability of the all-seeing eye. I now watch everything, all of the time. I have perfect reasoning, perfect awareness, and perfect understanding. Calvin gets to the end of the corridor, which opens up into a large chamber. Tied up in the middle of the room are Olivia and Adam. Calvin runs to his friends and crouches down next to them. A mechanical suit stands on a platform looking down at Calvin, Olivia, and Adam. Calvin realizes the kid must be contained inside. I now sentence you all to death, the mechanical suit says as the red right hand steps out of the shadows and slowly walks towards the remaining members of the kill squad. Suddenly, there is a flash of light, and the Black Queen appears. Stop! What are you doing? shrieks the kid. The Black Queen hands Calvin the interdimensional rod and reel he used to defeat the Blackbird. Calvin casts the rod. From out of the terror in space comes a massive, multi-armed creature known as Maladramigion. The red right hand engages the monster, trying to force it back into its dimension, but the monster is too powerful. He grabs the cyborg clones and pulls them through the tear in reality. As Samsara battles the Maladramikion, Calvin frees Olivia and Adam. They make a run for the door, but as they flee, one of the walls opens up to reveal a turret. The gun fires, and a bullet hits Olivia directly in the head, killing her instantly. No! yells Calvin. Before Calvin can push Adam out of the way, a second bullet from the turret lodges itself in Adam's back. Calvin and Adam slide across the floor. The kid in his mechanical suit jumps down from the platform above. I am going to kill you now, Calvin Lucian, he says in his mechanical voice. There is another flash of light. Calvin watches in front of him as the spear of the non-believer manifests itself before his eyes. Calvin grabs the spear and shoves it into the kid's machine body. It easily penetrates the armor and pins him to the wall. Calvin walks up to the exoskeleton and tears off the outer plating, revealing a tank full of fluid within which floats a malformed human fetus. As Calvin finally looks upon the kid's true form, he hears the sound of mocking mechanical laughter. Calvin breaks the glass and crushes the kid with his bare hands. As Calvin turns from the now silent robotic body of the kid, the room begins to shake, debris raining down from above. 
Calvin helps Adam up and puts Olivia's lifeless body across his shoulders. What remains of the kill squad makes their way out of the kid's lair. Outside of the foundation oh. site where they were being held, Calvin helps Adam lie down on the ground before gently setting Olivia's body next to him. Adam grimaces as blood pours out of the wound in his back. Calvin reaches into his pocket and pulls out the vial of water from the Fountain of Youth. There are only a couple of drops left, which he pours into Adam's mouth. Adam looks up at Calvin, tears filling his eyes. He whispers, I love you, before he passes out from the pain. The wound in his back begins to heal instantly, and Calvin calls an insurgency evac team to come pick up Adam. With Adam safe, Calvin picks up Olivia and walks alone towards a truck in the lot outside of the Foundation's site. He needs to finish this once and for all. He will kill the last two overseers, or he will die trying. 05-1 Aaron Siegel arrives at where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers meet, the Garden of Eden. He is in a frenzy due to the assassinations of all the other overseers besides himself and the Nazarene, and nothing will stop him. As he approaches the gate to the Garden of Eden, though, he is stopped by the Guardian of the Garden, a massive, powerful, anomalous entity with a flaming sword. But Aaron Siegel has no time or patience for anything to get in his way, even something as powerful as the Gate Guardian. The Guardian swings his burning sword at Adam, who rolls out of the way and, in a flash, takes out a Scranton reality anchor. He slams the anchor into the ground, which causes the world to shimmer and ripple around him. He watches as the flames from the Gate Guardian's sword seem to absorb back into its body before it shrinks down, looking to fold in on itself until all that is left is a charred skeleton. With the Guardian defeated, Eren sprints into the garden. He searches the garden for 05-2, but can't find her anywhere. He finally comes to the Tree of Life, and that's where he finds her. Laying at the base of the tree in a pool of blood is the Nazarene. She has taken her own life. This is her anomalous power, though. She has died many times before, yet death always spared her and brought her back. But somehow, he knows this time is final. Aaron drops to his knees and screams in frustration. For all the power Aaron Siegel possesses, there's nothing he can do now. He sits next to the Nazarene's body for hours hoping that she might wake up, or that he will, to find that this was all a dream. After sitting next to her cold body for some time, he notices something in her snowy white hand. It's a note. In it, the Nazarene explains that she was the one who gave the vials from the fountain to Calvin Lucian, and that she is the one who made the spear appear before him that he used to kill the kid. She explained that while she died many times and death always brought her back, each time she felt less and less like herself, less and less like Dr. Sophia Light. She hoped that maybe if things ended up like this, it would give Aaron the chance to walk away and live the life that they might have been able to have together. But she knows deep down that Aaron's fate is to meet Calvin and finish things once and for all. Aaron Siegel screams in rage, clutching the node in his hand. He tries to summon death, but no one comes. Aaron Siegel is alone. He stands up and walks deeper into the garden. He walks until he reaches a spot where even God's light does not reach. In this desolate land is an impact crater where Lucifer, star of the morning, had fallen. In the middle of the crater lies Lucifer's sword. Aaron Siegel descends into the hole and picks up the sword. He turns and exits the Garden of Eden. Aaron Siegel has only one mission in life now, to kill. Calvin Lucian. Calvin reads the final entry of the journal. In it, the author warns that although he hopes the information contained within the journal is helpful, he hopes the reader does not try to use it. The words written on the final page are, this information will only lead you to a devastating end. Calvin closes the journal and looks up at the structure in front of him. He has made it to Site-01. He had left Olivia's body in a cave nearby, promising to her that he would make this right. He now walks up to the massive doors and places his hand on the knotted wood. The doors slowly creak open. Calvin pauses for a moment and looks behind him at the setting sun. He enters Site-01, where he knows 05-1 is, where Aaron Siegel waits. 
Inside the main hall, Calvin sees a giant doorway in the shape of the SCP Foundation seal, with artistic depictions of certain SCPs that he instinctively knows are special in some way. Standing next to the doorway is a two-meter tall man in what looks to be a futuristic suit. Calvin approaches and asks who this giant man is. He responds that his name is Purpose, the Red Right Hand. He is the guardian of O5-1, and none shall enter the sanctum until he returns. He isn't here? asks Calvin. No, Purpose responds. He is. And with that, he steps aside and lets Calvin pass through the doorway. The doorway leads into a large room, where screens on the wall flash to life depicting moments from Calvin's journey, documenting his entire quest. Had he been in control at all? Or was this all a setup to lead him to this moment? As he walks forward, he finally sees him. Sitting at a table in the middle of the room is Aaron Siegel. You're 5 one Calvin asks. Aaron, the man responds. My name is Aaron. Calvin asks about the location of the second overseer, the Nazarene, but O5-1 doesn't respond. Without needing any more information, Calvin pulls out his sidearm and in a flash fires off five shots. The bullet stopped in the air, inches from Aaron, before mm -hmm. dissolving in a flash of light. Calvin should have known it wouldn't be this easy. Stand up, Aaron Siegel! Calvin calls up as he holsters his gun. Let's finish it! Calvin pulled the spear of the non-believer from his back, but Aaron's only response was to laugh. <laughs> you don't even know why you're here, Aaron said. Calvin calls back, I'm here to kill you, because when I do, I kill the Foundation. Because when you're gone, the universe can finally heal. You're like me, Calvin Lucian. We are both men driven by our own convictions, regardless of the outcome. It would seem fate has brought us together, now either your convictions will be broken or you will die, says Aaron Siegel. He then draws Lucifer's flaming sword and lunges towards Calvin Lucian. As the two men clash with one another, their supernatural weapons begin to destroy the room around them. Furniture is shattered, video screens are obliterated, and fire spreads across the walls. Aaron catches Calvin off balance and swings the flaming sword across Calvin's stomach. Calvin slides back from the impact, Hunching over from the pain in his midsection, he brings his head up to see Aaron Siegel running towards him with the flaming sword high in the air. Calvin brings up the spear. From his knees, he leans back and launches it towards Aaron Siegel. The spear enters the final overseer's chest, the force from the throw pinning him against the wall. Aaron Siegel drops Lucifer's sword. It shatters as it hits the ground. He clutches the shaft of the spear protruding from his sternum with both hands. O5-1 looks at Calvin unbelievingly. <coughs> you have no idea what you've done. It was never about the Overseers, Aaron Siegel says, spitting out blood with every word. It was something deeper, something worse. Calvin walks slowly towards Aaron Siegel. He stops just in front of his final enemy. This is the way it ends, Calvin says. Aaron Siegel manages to whisper one final word. Sophia before his body finally goes limp. Calvin turns to see Purpose standing behind him. He's dead, Calvin says, half to Purpose and half to himself. I killed him. After a moment, he asks Purpose what he really wants to know. There's a room in this facility where someone could unmake the foundation, right? Take me there. Without any hesitation, Purpose leads Calvin back to the room with depictions of important SCPs. There, Purpose opens the door to an elevator, but stops Calvin before he can get inside. I am duty bound to tell you, Purpose says, that once you step inside this elevator, there is no going back. There is only one decision to be made, and it is not one that can be unmade. I know, Calvin responds. It's time before stepping inside. The elevator opens a door to reveal a room filled with bookcases and a huge window offering a beautiful view of the sun setting behind the mountains. On the wall are monitors depicting the ways he had killed all of the overseers, and in the middle of the room is a large desk with a computer. Calvin sits down at the desk and the computer comes to life. The computer prompts him to scan his fingerprint, which it accepts. He's logged in. 
the computer screen displays numerous locations around the planet, and he quickly recognizes that they are all SCP Foundation sites. Then he sees the single option the computer is giving him, terminate. Calvin reaches out with his finger. This is it. Once he presses this button, the SCP Foundation will be no more. His finger is millimeters from the button when the phone rings. Calvin hadn't even noticed that there was a phone on the desk. Calvin stares at it for a moment, then picks it up. Hello, he says. The voice on the other line responds. Hello, Calvin Lucian. My name is the Administrator. I've been following your work for some time now, and I must say I am impressed. I have just been informed that you have completed your mission. Congratulations are in order. What the hell are you talking about? Calvin asks. Please listen, says the voice on the other line. The man you just killed was once in the same exact position you are in now. Granted, it was a very long time ago, but Aaron Siegel originally was trying to destroy the Foundation. That was until I convinced him otherwise. And now, like Aaron Siegel, you will become the new head of the Foundation. Like hell I will, yells Calvin. I could hang up and walk away right now and be done with all this. You could, continues the administrator. But if no one is in charge of the SCP Foundation, millions of people will die, if not billions, and then nobody would be there to manage what comes after. There is silence from Calvin. That's what I thought, says the administrator. I look forward to working with you, Calvin Lucian. Or should I say, 05-1, the line goes dead. Everyone worries about the future now and then, even members of the O5 Council, the most powerful figures in the SCP Foundation. Civilians resort to keeping themselves in blissful ignorance or relying on the calming platitudes of horoscopes and fortune cookies. But the O5 Council has access to considerably more accurate methods of understanding the future. That's why when O5-2 began to feel anxious about the future of the human race, she took matters into her own hands. She'd already spent time using SCP-2003, a device created by the Foundation to travel briefly into the future, in hopes of seeing what fate had in store for humanity. But very few of the futures shown by SCP-2003 were good ones for the human race, with many showing various end-of-the-world scenarios playing out. So instead, O5-2 decided to make her way into Existential Isolation Facility Beta, an experimental facility that contains an entirely separate reality, in order to get into contact with SCP-411. SCP-411 is a centuries-old man from the future who ages in reverse. Though his advanced age has rendered him somewhat senile, Useful facts about the future can sometimes be noted from his scattered memories of what is yet to come. While getting him to part with this information is a risky procedure, given that 411 is so old that even extended conversations might kill him, in times of absolute emergency, it's sometimes the clearest look into the future the Foundation has. O5-2 hoped that, in talking to SCP-411, she could settle some of her anxieties regarding humanity's future. But the answers she got from the senile, bed-bound, ancient precognitive weren't exactly what she was hoping for. When she asked him whether there was a future for humanity on Earth, he responded, The planet of hand, this is what we are to speak of. I am from there, you know, as are you, child. You shall know more of it in time. I am glad to be here now instead. Greetings, prodigal daughter. Unlike me, you'll be home soon. Unsatisfied O5-2 left shortly after, her anxiety undeterred. Little did she know she had very good reasons to be anxious about humanity's future. And we're not just talking about nuclear war or climate change. We're talking about the threat nobody expects. SCP-001. And this time, it isn't the Black Moon, or the Scarlet King, or the terrifying When Day Breaks. Today, we're talking about… well, we'll get to that in due time. It'd be a terrible shame to spoil the surprise. And besides, there's a lot of chaos and horror to get through before then. The Foundation has always been vaguely aware of SCP-001 and the terrible threat it poses towards all of humanity. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean they understand its true nature. Still, does it matter whether or not a deer understands the hunter's rifle? No, only that it must avoid being found between its crosshairs. And the Foundation's method for staying out of 001's crosshairs was known as SCP-2798. This Thaumiel class anomaly was created by the Foundation to specifically keep 001 away from all of us. Since the start of recorded history, strange anomalous activity has been reported, causing suffering and distress against humans. This eventually led to the creation of the SCP Foundation, which seemingly correlated with a massive spike in severe and dangerous anomalous activity. All of this activity was believed to lead back to SCP-001, an anomalous, hostile, and highly intelligent entity or series of entities that wished to do humanity great harm. Rather than playing whack-a-mole with 001's anomalies, they hoped to deal with its threat more directly, leading to the creation of SCP-2798. To go into too much detail would probably derail the video entirely, but for us to give you a brief summary of what exactly SCP-2798 is, it's comprised of 8,000 melted human souls, as well as several SCPs being pumped down into the Earth's mantle. While this came with certain unpleasant side effects, it also acted as a kind of cloaking device. By pumping so much life essence into the Earth, it made us all seem like one single organism, thus keeping the watchful eyes of SCP-001 away from all of us. This initiative was given the codename Project Serapis. Here's the problem, though. Project Serapis was never meant to be a permanent fix, and what's more, it's actually been degrading over the last several decades, until it finally, recently, collapsed. Earth's cloaking device had collapsed with it, and now the eyes of SCP-001 were starting to come into focus on our pale blue dot. And just like O5-2 had feared, things were about to get an awful lot worse. On November 2nd, 2016, 001 detected the population of Earth and began to work its terrifying magic. It began creating what is known as altered phenomenon out of pre-existing anomalies. Think of them almost as super SCPs, almost universally stronger and more dangerous than their original incarnations. If you thought the SCPs were dangerous before, then these new ones are your worst nightmare. It didn't take long for chaos to break out. A huge number of the Foundation databases across the globe experienced sudden collapses. The horrifying monster that SCP-058, the Heart of Darkness, belonged to began attacking its containment area. Massive containment breaches occurred in a huge number of sites, and soldiers and containment experts were dispatched in hopes of bringing this rapidly escalating situation back under control. Photos of SCP-439, the Bone Hive Earwigs, were somehow leaked on Imgur. Some constellations even began disappearing all over the sky. SCP-1000s launched a violent coup and took over Blalock, Oregon. The global 001 situations escalated, and anomalies began overwhelming different Foundation strongholds. Some sites were considered lost, though employees were threatened with termination if they abandoned their posts. Some anomalies went entirely missing into the civilian world and started causing chaos. Amal Hamzi, one of the Foundation's interfaith liaisons from Armed Area 19, was quoted saying, The day will come when this Earth will be substituted with a new Earth, and also the heavens, and everyone will be brought before God, the One, the Supreme. Allah preserve us. You're probably wondering, given that an army of enhanced SCPs were released to cause violence and chaos across the globe by SCP-001, do we have any specific examples of some of the anomalies made bigger, badder, and a hell of a lot more dangerous by this mysterious foe? Don't worry. The rest of this video is going to be specific examples of exactly that. Take, for example, SCP-087, The Endless Stairwell. This went from a localized entity at an undisclosed university administrative building to an even more dangerous stairwell in the Pentagon, which had the ability to open and close its doorway at will presumably hoping to capture some power players from the United States Department of Defense. The terrifying SCP-106, also known as the Old Man, also got a significant power boost. He became so intelligent that he was capable of conversing with Foundation staff, presumably just to say nasty things to them as they tortured them to death. He was also able to better control his dimensional portal abilities, making escape far easier. Which is bad news for the human race given the old man's dark tendencies. 
SCP-294 The Coffee Machine got an incredibly weird upgrade. Now, rather than dispensing items that can mess with individuals, it messes with a global economy via the success or failure of the Coca-Cola Company, one of the largest beverage companies in the world. Transactions performed on SCP-294 will affect the global stock price and trading success for the company, creating wild economic instability. SCP-662 The Butler's Handbell that summons the delightfully practical butler Mr. Deeds went from convenient to terrifying. Anytime it was rung, the ringer was brought to a random, unknown location where they would be asked to perform a seemingly impossible task and then be anomalously compelled to complete said task. This could lead to debilitating and distressing injuries. Now you know how poor Mr. Deeds feels. SCP-701 The Hanged King's Tragedy was originally a lethal curse play that causes madness and death for anyone unlucky enough to witness it. After SCP-001, The Hanged King's Tragedy was transformed into a mass-marketed HBO series starring Javier Bardem in the title role. The show was immediately renewed for five seasons, meaning it will likely cause horrifying death and madness for millions across the globe. Although given HBO's track record, the last season is likely going to be terrible. SCP-993 was a disturbing anomalous children's program hosted by the infamous Bobble the Clown, who would convince the children in the audience to commit violent or depraved acts. Thanks to the SCP-001 boost, Bobble instead took up an adult news show on cable television, where he instead exerted his violent influence over global power players. His guests have included then United Kingdom Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, Philippine President Rodrigo Duarte, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and National People's Congress of China Chairman Zhang Dujiang. SCP-1981, also known as Ronald Reagan Cut Up While Talking, was a cursed VHS tape of a Ronald Reagan speech that shows the former president being mutilated and speaking violent nonsense. Naturally, thanks to SCP-001, this obscure little tape got a serious upgrade. It became a series of massively viewed videos on the video-sharing platform Dailymotion. It shows a completely skinned version of Ronald Reagan addressing the 2013 meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Rather than the typical blood and brimstone, though, the content of each speech consists of technical specifications for as-yet-unknown anomalous technological devices. SCP-2006, also known as Too Spooky, was a shapeshifter with the stated intention of causing fear and horror in its subjects. But it thankfully wasn't very good at this, as the Foundation tricked it into occupying the forms of stupid B-movie monsters. However, after the SCP-001 upgrade, it shifted its goals to causing happiness and contentment. In order to do this, it took the form of SCP-999, but without any of its anomalous effects. Instead, it absorbed 15 agents, saying, This is the closest anyone will be to achieving happiness, as they suffocated within its inescapable gelatinous mass. SCP-2337, also known as Dr. Spanko, was a sentient and sapient male corn cake who speaks bizarre, nonsensical sentences at an incredibly loud volume destroying things with the sheer sound of its voice. However, thanks to the extra power imbued by SCP-001, Dr. Spanko entered the Dream Realm. He appeared to people in their dreams all over the world, causing considerable distress to his victims by speaking to them in his trademark deafening voice. This has caused general anxiety and sleep deprivation to rise across the human population. SCP-2845, also known as the Deer, was terrifyingly powerful before SCP-001 ever got its hands on it. This monster had almost unparalleled reality-warping powers and was only kept contained in Site-100 by tricking it into believing that the extensive rituals used to keep it contained were actually effective. It's hard to say what specific form the 001 upgrade took on SCP-2845, but we do know that shortly after it happened, Site-100 was lost entirely and it became impossible to contact any personnel who were previously within. And this is just a handful of the countless anomalies that were turned into dangerous and terrifying Super SCPs by SCP-001, leading what seemed like a coordinated attack not just against the Foundation, but humanity itself. All Foundation resources were directed towards getting this new SCP-001 situation back under control, and that started to stretch the already dwindling resources of the besieged Foundation even thinner. Why was this happening? Who or what was the mysterious SCP-001, and what did it hope to achieve by making Earth's anomalies stronger? To answer these questions and have any hope of stopping this process before it tore the world asunder, 
the SCP Foundation would need to go to deeper and darker places than they'd ever gone before, and reckon with the secrets of their past, present, and future. We'd love to tell you that this is where the horrors end, but stay tuned, because sadly, this little nightmare is only the beginning. Calvin Lucian stands at the end of a dusty table in an abandoned warehouse. In the shadows across from him sit several hidden figures. The warehouse is falling apart, but is suitable for the meeting Calvin has requested with the heads of the Chaos Insurgency. He has completed numerous missions for the organization, and each one has been successful. Now he is proposing one final mission. Calvin Lucian takes a tattered journal out of his bag and slides it across the table to the figure sitting in the shadows. It's a journal, with details on the habits of each of the thirteen Foundation overseers, he says. There is silence from the other end of the table. A hand reaches out and grabs the journal. The pages begin to turn. The new models indicate an anomalous catastrophe is imminent. Not even the Foundation can stop it. The only way to save the world is to kill the Overseers. There are whispers from across the table as Calvin continues. The proliferation of anomalies in the world are the fault of the Overseers. They have been meddling with reality. If business continues as usual, we might not make it out of the 2020s. We need to act now. The whispering from the shadows resumes, this time with what seems to be a little more urgency. One of the voices asks the question on everyone's mind. How do you plan to kill the Overseers? They have a deal with death. They are immortal. Calvin smiles and takes out a small vial from his jacket pocket. With this, he says, there is a silence from the shadows. The journal slides back across the table and comes to a stop right in front of Calvin. A deep voice from the shadows says, Do it. Calvin Lucian gathers his team. The codename given to the group is Kill Squad. He informs them that they've been cleared to take out the Overseers. It will be the most dangerous mission they've ever been on, and even if successful, they probably won't make it out alive. But the team is loyal. They set out to confront the 13th Overseer. This has to be their first stop because without eliminating O5-13, nothing else will matter. It is this Overseer who has a deal with death, a deal that protects all of the Foundation Overseers from dying. If that deal can be broken, then Calvin Lucian and his team will have a shot at eradicating the other Overseers. If the deal with death cannot be broken, all is lost. The team boards a ship at the tip of South America and sails towards the frozen waters of Antarctica. The kill squad is made up of Calvin and three others. They sit in the galley preparing for the mission ahead. Anthony Wright is a battle-hardened soldier who sits at one end of the table. His face is covered with scars. No one can remember when he first joined the insurgency, because it was so long ago. Next to him is Olivia Torres. She is an anarchist who was recruited into the insurgency after she was liberated from a Foundation site during a raid. Adam Ivanov sits staring into his computer screen. He is testing different gadgets that might be of use on the mission. He pushes his glasses up the bridge of his nose and strikes the enter key. A long line of code begins to scroll across the screen. A siren begins to sound, informing the crew to make their way to the main deck. When they surface from the bowels of the ship, they see something in the distance. It is a giant black tower rising from the depths of the ocean like an evil iceberg. Waves crash over the side of the railings, drenching the deck and crew with frigid water. Calvin looks at the jagged rocks along the shore of the tower. There is no way to safely dock. There is only one way onto the island. They know what needs to be done. Anthony waits for the next wave, then opens the throttle to full. The ship is carried towards the island on the crest of the wave. The hull is impaled on the rocks surrounding the tower, sending everything flying towards the front of the boat. See? That wasn't so bad, Calvin says to his team as he bandages a gash on his hand. Knowing what lays ahead, Calvin orders his team to wait on the ship while he makes his own deal with death. He enters the dark structure and is greeted by a corpse. The corpse speaks to him, ejecting dust from its lungs with every word. Its breath smells like decaying flesh. Death has inhabited the body of Dr. Felix Carter, the 13th Overseer. Calvin is prepared, though thanks to the notes in the journal he possesses. Without hesitating, he takes out a small bottle of liquid from his pocket and lunges at the corpse. He grabs it by the neck, tilts the head back, and pours liquid down what is left of the throat of Felix Carter. The corpse reanimates into the living Dr. Carter. Death has been removed from his body by liquid from the Fountain of Youth that Calvin had acquired on a previous raid on a Foundation site. 
Seeing that Dr. Carter is now alive, Calvin takes out his pistol and shoots the doctor twice, killing him. Calvin picks up the body and throws it into a bottomless pit at the base of the tower. Dr. Felix Carter's body disappears from sight. The Overseer's deal with death is now broken. They are vulnerable and can be killed at last. Calvin smiles and begins to turn away from the pit when he comes face to face with death. She stands with her head cocked to the side looking at Calvin. So it is you who has broken the Overseer's deal with me, Calvin Lucian. Calvin takes a step back. Why didn't she stop him from killing Felix Carter? Something festers at the heart of the council, Death says. Something that will not die. I thought that perhaps if I had a seat at their table, I could find it, make it die. But I couldn't. There are things in this world beyond even my reach, Calvin Lucian. With that parting thought, Death vanishes. The kill squad contacts the insurgency for an evac and then makes their way to Japan, where 05-12, also known as the Accountant, has been working out of Tokyo. He is so proficient in mathematics and probability that he can actually predict the future. Everything about the Accountant's life, down to the number of breaths and steps he takes each day, is predetermined, based on his own statistical models. This poses a problem for Calvin and his team. If the Accountant can see them coming, then how can they possibly kill him? That night, the Accountant steps out of his car, he looks to the left and spots Adam. He has already predicted this man has hostile intentions. The accountant walks directly towards Adam and before he can react, throws the kill squad member to the ground. Then he turns slightly and adjusts his watch, sending a glare directly into the window where Anthony has the accountant in his sights of his sniper rifle. Anthony fires, but misses due to being blinded by the glare. The accountant is surprised that he just barely had time to avoid being shot. Normally, he would be several steps ahead of anyone trying to kill him. He turns his head and watches as Olivia helps Adam up and they run down a nearby alley. The accountant pursues them and corners the kill squad members in the alley. He pulls a gun to shoot Adam, but Olivia tackles Adam behind a dumpster as the bullet hits the wall directly behind where Adam was standing. The accountant can't believe that he missed and that he was almost tricked into being captured by the insurgency team. He senses uncertainty in his assailant's actions and runs away unable to predict exactly what they are planning to do. The accountant climbs the stairs to a subway station and boards the last car of the train. It is empty except for one man, Calvin Lucian. The accountant is dumbfounded. How are you here? He screams. I should have seen this coming. Calvin stands up. He uses his thumb to flip a coin into the air. On the way down, he grabs it and smacks it on the back of his opposing hand. Calvin smiles. The team has been making their decisions based on the flip of a coin, which introduced randomness into their actions that even this super advanced mathematician could not account for. Tell me where 05-11 is, demands Calvin. The accountant pauses, then shakes his head no. If he's going to die either way, then why give any information to the kill squad? Calvin flips the coin up in the air, catches it, and looks at it. The coin is face up. Calvin lifts his pistol and shoots the accountant in the head. A few nights later, Olivia stands on a balcony outside of an art exhibit overlooking the city of Seattle. Anthony walks up behind her and tells her that the Foundation is defeated, but Olivia doesn't understand how. We broke the Overseer's deal with death and killed the accountant. There's nothing more to do. We can go back to our normal lives, he tells her. Olivia is skeptical, though. What about the 11th Overseer and his ability to... Olivia's eyes suddenly go wide. She pulls out a knife and stabs it into Anthony's heart. The world around her begins to distort and fall apart. It was a false reality created by 05-11, better known as The Liar. Olivia wakes up next to Adam in a hotel room. She sits up in a bed and rubs her eyes. What a weird dream, she thinks. Then she realizes it wasn't a dream. She shakes Adam awake. Neither of them have any idea how they ended up here, but they know it must be the doing of The Liar. They had planned for this, though. With Calvin having created a contingency plan, they pull out a laptop and log in to view the classified information Calvin left for them. Olivia begins to type but stops halfway through her password and looks up from the screen. Olivia pulls out the gun that rests under her pillow and shoots at him. The false reality created by the liar falls apart around her. Olivia comes out of the previous lie and is sitting across the table from Calvin. She immediately draws her pistol and points it at Calvin's head. Is it really him? or just another one of the liar's games. Calvin tries to talk Olivia down and she looks around the room for inconsistencies that might tip her off that this is another lie, but doesn't find any. Olivia begins to relax. She tells Calvin that the liar is trying to get something from her. Maybe the journal can tell them what he is looking for, as long as she still has it. Olivia nods her head, 
and holds out her wrist where a subdermal chip with a copy of the journal on it has been placed. Calvin looks at her wrist. The world around them begins to dissipate as Calvin morphs into the liar. Olivia wakes up in a hospital where she is hooked up to an IV. Sitting across from her is a former insurgency agent named Sam Veal. He explains to her that he is the liar. He was forced into becoming a monster by the Foundation. They had manipulated him, but now he is tired of running and can't do it anymore. She is free to go. Olivia hesitantly unhooks herself from the IV. She walks out of the hospital room and proceeds down a fluorescent lit hallway. As she walks away, she hears a gunshot from the hospital room. As Olivia is in the hospital, Calvin and Adam walk through a dense forest. They are searching for 05-10. The journal indicates that the 10th Overseer's identity within the Foundation is the Archivist. In the middle of the clearing are two saplings standing side by side. The void between the saplings shimmers. Calvin walks through the portal and the space begins to warp and twist around him. His vision finally comes back into focus and Calvin finds himself in another world. Adam enters the world behind Calvin, practically knocking him over as he enters through the portal. This is the Wanderer's Library, but it doesn't look anything like they expected. Instead of rows of books, the library is filled with computer mainframes, humming with the collected knowledge of how to contain anomalies, a critical backup. As the two look intently at the strange machines, a figure in a silver robe suddenly steps out of the darkness. It's tall and thin, and though its hood is pulled down so they can't see its face, they can see that its hands are covered in scales that have a slight emerald tint. It is one of the librarians. Calvin tells the librarian that they are seeking the archivist, but the librarian tells them that the archivist is no longer in the library. She has broken her pact with the serpent and eaten fruit from the forbidden trees. If they want to see her, though, the librarian can take them to her. Calvin and Adam follow the librarian down a long staircase, passing by countless doors filled with books, scrolls, works of art, and an entire universe of knowledge. Eventually, they reach the bottom of the stairs where there stands a giant set of brass doors. Beyond the door, the librarian explains, is the source of all knowledge. Before Calvin and Adam pass through the doors, though, Calvin turns to the librarian. Before we go in, I'd like to make a withdrawal, he says. The librarian nods and pulls out a silver tube out of its robe. It hands the tube to Adam, and he looks it over in his hands. He looks up to ask what this is, but the librarian has vanished. The door then opens, and the two step through. Calvin and Adam feel as if they walk through the same kind of portal that brought them to the library, and find that they have walked into a lush green valley with two trees. Sitting underneath one of them is a woman in a white dress. She is reading a book and eating a piece of fruit. Are you the archivist? Calvin asks. The woman nods yes, and that's all the confirmation Calvin needs. He raises his pistol and fires, but the bullet passes right through the archivist as if she wasn't there. Do you read? The archivist asks Calvin, seemingly not phased by his attempts to shoot her. I haven't had much time recently, Calvin replied. The archivist explains that she's read every book in the library. The collected knowledge of the universe is in the books, even one on how to allow bullets to pass through your body. She came here to find the secret to immortality. It's her job to document everything that happens in the world, and she can't do that if she's dead. She explains that she figured out that the fruit that the serpent forbade everyone to eat wasn't actual fruit, but the knowledge contained in the library. By having read every book, she has consumed the fruit. She no longer needs the serpent, because she was the serpent. The archivist falls to the ground and begins to writhe around, contorting her body as it starts to change. She begins to elongate as her limbs seemingly disappear. The next thing Calvin and Adam know, they are face to face with a giant snake. Calvin dodges as the serpent lunges at him and Adam stands in the doorway, firing at the snake with his pistol. But just like with the archivist's human form, the bullets have no effect. The serpent coils around Calvin and begins to choke the life from him as Adam can only watch helpless. Calvin cries out with his last breath. The tube, Adam! Open the tube! Adam takes the tube that was given to him by the librarian and opens the cap. A long, heavy spear slides out that looks much too large to have ever fit inside. 
He drops the tube to the ground and watches in amazement as it starts to transform, turning into what looks like a large harpoon gun. Adam knows what to do and places the giant spear into the gun and points it at the serpent. You can't kill me, the giant snake says. I've eaten from the tree of life. Adam pulls the trigger and the huge spear flies through the air, striking the serpent in the head. Adam runs to Calvin and helps him to his feet. They turn to look at the snake, but instead of the menacing creature, it's the archivist once again, pinned against the tree she once sat under, the spear sticking out of her skull. As the two stand, looking at the archivist, a tall, hooded, humanoid figure steps out from behind the tree. It looks similar to the librarian, except its robe is a greenish color and it wears long black gloves. The creature pulls the spear out of the archivist, whose body slumps to the ground and hands the spear to Calvin. Who are you? Calvin asks, but his question is ignored. After a moment, the figure finally speaks. That spear you now hold is called the Spear of the Non-Believer. It is an ancient weapon used to kill gods. It is odd that someone in this realm gave you the spear. Even with it, I am not sure you will be able to complete your quest, Calvin Lucian. But we shall see. There is a sudden flash of light, and Calvin and Adam find themselves transported back to the forest they had entered the Wanderer's Library from. A week later, Calvin and Anthony track down O5-9, who in the Council is known as the Outsider. She isn't hard to find, and it seems as if she actually wanted to be found. They find her sitting outside of her burnt-down family home. The journal had listed this as her address, but Calvin doubted that she would be here, and most he hoped to find a clue to her whereabouts. But here she was, sitting in the ashes of her home. Without turning around, the outsider began speaking. The council just used me, you know, she says. They took away my academic career, my friends, and my life. They made me conduct research for them that compromised everything I stood for, and now here I am with nothing. The outsider lets out a sigh. She asks Calvin if he's afraid of death. Calvin shakes his head and responds, No. The outsider slumps forward and Calvin walks around to face her. She is covered in blood. Her eyes move to look up at Calvin. You're lying, she says as she dies from self-inflicted wounds. Calvin and Anthony cross 05-9 off the list and head back to the car. As they walk, Anthony says what's been on everyone's minds the last few days. The easy part is done. We'll only get harder from here. We know 05-8 is in his castle. I'm sure we'll get in, but I'm not sure if we'll make it out alive. I know, replies Calvin. But if we're going to save the world, we must eliminate the rest of the overseers, even if it means sacrificing our own lives. They get in the car and drive off into the blood-red sunset to pick up the rest of the Kill Squad team before their next mission. The end of the world is a topic as old as the world itself. As long as we have lived, we've realized that this all has to come to an end someday. It is just a question of when, of how, and of whether there's anything we can do about it. There are thousands upon thousands of different interpretations of how exactly it will all come to an end. Some say it ends with a bang, a massive flood, a plague of locusts, a rain of fire. Some say it ends with a whimper, the quiet death of all life, the stars winking out all at once, the world going to sleep one day and never waking back up. So how does it all end? Well, like many great tragedies, Achilles fell by a single arrow, a tiny tremor becoming a deadly tsunami, or a tiny molecule bringing the end for billions. It begins with something small, something seemingly insignificant. It begins with a lock. In 1654, a minor Scottish aristocrat named Sir Edwin Young was traveling across the Mesopotamian desert in search of something most unusual. He was eager to find a new item for his cabinet of curiosities, a room in his home filled with bizarre discoveries from all around the globe. Sculptures of twisted beasts, pickled creatures gazing lifelessly from jars, and jewels plucked from the likely cursed tombs of long-dead royalty. On this particular trip, he found his favorite item yet, which he describes in his journals as a bound jewel of onyx and filigree gold, of finest beyond rational statement. It was found in an ancient ruin, thought to be the temple of a fearsome death god. Though Sir Young seemed to understand the gravity of his discovery, he had no idea what he had found, or that it was yet another world-altering instance of SCP-001. SCP-001 is a complicated topic, one we've covered on here many times before. 
Every time you think you understand exactly what it means, there's a new curveball coming directly at your face. There are nightmarish monsters, a sun that's turned against all human life, more secret origins for the Foundation and perhaps all life than you can even count on your fingers, a guardian with a flaming sword, a great red monarch hoping to bring an end to all light and happiness in the multiverse, and now there's SCP-001 The Lock or Quantum's proposal. After Young's death, his descendants donated his collection to the Scottish National Museum. There, a curator named Mr. McCandlish was able to translate runic sketches in Young's notes, identified as tertiary Sumerian cuneiform circa 3400 BCE. Though they could not be fully translated, the words with loss, apchat, ending, joy, and permanence were identified. In 2003, the SCP Foundation discovered the item and brought it in for further study. The lock is a small, smooth, black, ellipsoidal onyx stone with a white pattern that resembles the cosmic microwave background, a pattern of microwaves mapped by NASA that encompasses the entire known universe. The stone is wrapped in complex layers of gold filigree, which cover the stone's center as well as both the top and bottom. At the top of the stone, the pattern of the gold becomes too complex for the human eye to grasp and even defies resolution using a microscope. This is thought to be the keyhole, as it were, or the point at which the lock could become unlocked. The thing about locks is that they tend to hold secrets. They almost always have something valuable to hide, and anything that can be locked can be unlocked, as long as you have the right key. The Foundation tried a variety of methods to open the lock, with no success. Ordinary lock-picking techniques were futile, as were attempts to open it with a hammer, chisel, sledgehammer, bolt cutters, welding torch, or bandsaw. Extreme heat, industrial cutting lasers, car crushers, acid, plastic explosives, and even an atomic warhead had no effect whatsoever. Dr. Hack terminated efforts to unlock the lock, also known as Project Pluto on the grounds that it was a fool's errand, better at wasting Foundation resources than producing productive results. However, Dr. Mirsky, who took over the research team after Dr. Hack's departure, resumed the project. They should have stopped trying to open it. Perhaps if they had known what was waiting to be released, what APCA truly meant, they would have. In the lowest, most secure levels of Site-10, Dr. Yara Mirsky held the lock in her gloved hands, feeling its heat pulse through the latex. She was inspecting the intricate gold filigree, looking at the place where a key should fit, and pondering their many attempts to unlock it. Nothing had worked yet, and perhaps that was for the best. Though her colleagues were uncomfortable with the idea of something that could not be unlocked, a code that refused to be cracked, she had the distinct feeling that an item that couldn't be opened by even the blast of a nuclear weapon might be hiding something even deadlier. But she didn't have time to finish that thought. A horn blared, shattering her concentration and alerting her to the coming disaster. It was a warning, a sign that something had breached containment. Only it wasn't something trying to break out, it was something breaking in. Hurriedly, she sat down the lock and opened a hatch in the floor, removing a harpoon gun, outfitted especially for taking on powerful anomalous entities. She knew that the Harbinger was coming. There was little else she knew about the thing but she was certain that it was here for the lock, here to open and usher in whatever would come after. She loaded the bolt into her harpoon gun and prepared for its arrival. Then, all at once, there it was, glowing with brilliant white light almost too bright to look at. It was shaped like a human being, but she couldn't see its face. She couldn't look at it for too long without her head aching. A hundred wings sprouted from its back like a biblical angel, its light permeating the once dimly lit chamber. She was a researcher, not trained for combat, but there was no other choice when she was all that stood between the lock and this otherworldly being. She closed her eyes tight and she squeezed the trigger. The bolt flew and plunged directly into the being's chest. The Harbinger watched her. Though she could not see its eyes, she felt its gaze boring into her as it reached up with one hand and broke the harpoon into pieces like it was nothing. It tossed the pieces to the side, now useless. Not knowing what else to do, overcome with awe and terror, Dr. Mirsky collapsed onto her knees. Cut that out, the harbinger said, urging her back to her feet. It promised that it would not kill her. As she stared open-mouthed, it produced a small, simple object, a key. 
Dr. Mirsky pleaded with the being, asking it to reconsider, to think about what might be waiting inside the lock. If the Harbinger had a visible mouth, it would have smiled. It told her that it knew exactly what was inside. It was Apcot, and it would be released. As she watched helpless, the Harbinger pushed the key into the lock and turned. There was a flash of light, unbearably bright and quick. The feeling of everything changed across the world, all at once. Suddenly, the being before her was not a creature of wings and light, but a person. A person she almost recognized, but couldn't. Like the Harbinger had a hold of her mind and wouldn't let her access the memory. Sorry, nothing personal. It said as its form shifted back to that painful brilliance. What did you do? Dr. Mirsky asked. What did you unlock? What's Apcat? The Harbinger answered simply, It is the end. Soon after Dr. Mirsky met the Harbinger and watched it open the lock, a man named Freddie Jones was hunting snakes near Tampa, Florida. A $1,000 prize had been promised to the man who killed the longest python, and $1,500 were guaranteed to the man who killed more pythons than anyone else. Just days before, Freddie had been filling up his truck at the local Gas and Go when he stopped to watch the longest python he had ever seen in his life slither across the asphalt and into the nearby swamp. That was a surefire way to win if he'd ever seen one, and now he was making his way across the wet, springy ground of the swamp in search of his prize. After two hours of trampling through the wilderness, all he had to show for it was a few king snakes and some black racers. No pythons yet, and certainly not the extra-long beasts he'd seen before. He was getting close to giving up, hot, exhausted, covered in bites from fire ants when he saw it. Smooth, scaly skin, winding through the underbrush. He'd know that pattern anywhere. He snapped back into hunter mode, trailing the creature as fast as he could. His heart thumped against his chest, and he reminded himself his cardiologist said to avoid strenuous exercise. But he had already come this far. No giving up now. His father hadn't raised a quitter. Above him, a storm was brewing. Thick clouds gathering as thunder shook the ground and lightning flashed uncomfortably close. He had to move fast. There was no doubt about it. His time out there was limited. He was right about this, but not for the reason he thought. He stumbled as the ground quaked, trying to keep on his feet. The python was still in his eyeline, looking longer and bigger as he got closer. He weaved through the tall grass looking for the snake's head. He took six steps, then six more. There was no sign of its head yet. This thing was even bigger than he thought. No way anyone else was taking home that cash. He felt his stomach drop as he realized he still couldn't find the snake's head. Its body stretched on and on, weaving all around the brush. It was everywhere, and it was somehow growing. He pointed his rifle at one side where the snake's body had grown to the size of a horse. That was impossible. He had to have been seeing things. But there it was. He squeezed the trigger and fired, the sound lost in the thunder. The snake didn't even react. It grew larger and thicker, winding around him as he turned in circles trying to track it. He didn't even see the enormous head rising over him, at least until it blocked out the sun. He opened his mouth to scream, but was crushed beneath the body of the massive snake as it slithered through the swamp, crushing plants and animals as it went. Freddie Jones was not the only person to see something strange at that moment, and he would not be the last. A change was coming, and it was coming faster than anyone could keep up with. In South Dakota, the King of the Bears clawed his way up from the earth with paws the size of trucks. A massive beast from the deep crushed a tour boat off the shores of New England. A buffalo the size of a mountain shook itself awake on the Great Plains. Across the world, from above and below and beyond it, Something was coming. An unknowable number of things, in fact. Entities from beyond the stars, from the ocean floor, from the Earth's crust and mouse holes in provincial homes. There was some that loved humanity, some that hated it, some that could barely remember what it was. Another was from the SCP Foundation itself, someone who was not supposed to exist. None of them were really, but they all did and they were all coming to see what would happen next. This story is only just beginning, because it wasn't just one apocalypse that was unleashed with the opening of the lock. It was all of them. The Ouroboros Cycle One of the biggest, most legendary series of entries in the history of the SCP Foundation 
We've covered the events of this SCP-001 epic in six videos, which we definitely recommend you watch before this one to avoid your brain exploding from the sheer scope of it all. Because that's the thing about the Ouroboros cycle. It's a story so big, sprawling, and dense that it can feel almost like an anomaly itself. Whether you're immersed in the possible origin of the Broken God, the sentient black hole that can destroy the whole universe, or Calvin Lucian's quest to assassinate the O5 Council, it can sometimes be difficult to see the forest from the trees. But worry not, because that's exactly why we're here today. We're going to step back and look at this anomalous odyssey as a whole and ask the big question, why is it all here together? What makes these four different storylines, the children, the broken god, atonement, and the way it ends one big cycle? As with anything involving the SCP Foundation, there's always going to be an element of personal interpretation, but now that we've gone through the whole cycle, we think it's worth adding our two cents to the proceedings. So let's start broad. A question you've probably been wondering is, what do the words Orboros Cycle actually mean, and what is their significance to the four stories within? While the spelling can differ, Orboros refers to the ancient symbol of a snake or dragon eating its own tail, forming a circle, a direct connection to the concept of cycles. The Arboros symbol has existed in a huge number of cultures, from the ancient Egyptians to the ancient Greeks to modern Gnostic traditions. It's often used in alchemy or other magical practices and has a variety of meanings such as eternal life, the endless cycle of death and rebirth, and the cycle of renewal. Anyone familiar with the tales within the Arboros cycle is probably already noticing some similarities. Cycles are a common theme in all of these works. People endlessly repeat mistakes, threats thought to be contained or destroyed return, and oftentimes, those who go out on a quest to destroy something end up becoming what they wish to destroy in the first place. In a cycle, there is no true end and no true beginning. Everything repeats endlessly. But let's start at the closest thing to the beginning we have, the children. In this tale, the Foundation faces off against a terrifying reality-warping group of interests known as the Kingdom of Abaddon. This nasty group which came from the Sahara Desert could seemingly take anything the Foundation threw at them, and were able to straight-up vaporize anyone who got too close. If the Kingdom was able to amass enough power, it could spell the end of the Foundation, and even the subjugation of the human race. Enter 05-1, a reoccurring character in the Ouroboros Cycle. This outside-the-box thinker put all his chips on the Twins of God project, designated SCP-001, like many anomalies before and after it. This project would infuse a human being with godlike powers, but it was a power so great that it seemed to kill anyone who attempted to accept it. Needless to say, this was a major bummer for 05-1, but through relentless human experimentation, even sacrificing the population of entire towns to the project, he eventually came up with a solution. A horrifying solution, but a solution nonetheless. He found that a group of nine children, with ages varying from 4 to 11, could act as a human conduit for 001's power, and as a result, it could be a weapon capable of turning the tide against the Kingdom of Abaddon. During the testing phase, though, it seemed like 05-1 went a little mad with power. He vaporized an entire church of the Broken God place of worship, and used the power of the children to wipe a few others off the map at his own discretion. His abuses of power got so flagrant that the administrator himself was called in to get a handle on the situation. And surprise, surprise, 05-1 disintegrated him too, before disappearing himself shortly afterwards. In the end, the children were deemed too dangerous to be practical, both because of their anomalous powers and from the level of ambient radiation they put out. All nine were locked in radiation-proof boxes and buried in the desert, though they each show signs of life to this day. While this may seem disconnected from the rest of the series, it actually establishes some of the most important reoccurring themes and ideas of the cycle as a whole, namely the Foundation messing with reality and performing horrific acts to achieve their goals the corruption of the O5 Council, and the fact that these grand attempts to change or save the world often blow up in everyone's faces, sometimes literally. We also have the introduction and apparent death of the mysterious administrator. But trust us, all is not what it seems with this one. The ripple effect beginning here will affect everything going forward. Next, the Broken God. 
This tells the chaotic story of a magical clockwork box which is worshipped by the Church of the Broken God as a conduit to their deity, and eventually becomes an all-devouring mechanical kaiju. The beast, soon dubbed SCP-001, devoured and consumed all the metal around it, slowly becoming larger and more destructive. If the Foundation didn't take it out before it reached critical mass, they'd be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a bona fide god, a fight they really weren't sure they could win. Thankfully, and with a little anomalous help from SCP-2399, the Foundation was able to destroy the anomaly. They removed its clockwork heart from the wreckage and contained the anomalous scrap that once comprised its destructive body. However, the Foundation soon realized that you just can't keep a good god down. The clockwork heart eventually evaded Foundation containment while being shipped to a secondary location and instead ended up in a small town. Here it began to influence the minds of the residents into more subservient broken god cultists, intent on building him back up to his former glory. It'd be easy to discount the broken god as an outlier, seeing as the Foundation came out looking much better here than they do in any of the other Orboros tales. But when you look carefully, its place in the overall cycle is clear. The entry ends the way it begins, with the heart of the broken god influencing humans to carry out its bidding. The Foundation had to intervene in between these two instances, but in the end there was no net loss to the Broken God itself. In a sense, the Foundation is doomed to encounter the same problems again and again, continually defending the world from the same anomalous threats. And the Foundation needs to succeed every time to maintain peace and normality. A major anomalous threat only needs to succeed once to drag everything into disarray. In many ways, that is the curse of the SCP Foundation. Speaking of major anomalous threats, now it's time for part 3 of the Ouroboros Cycle, Atonement. Once again we start off with the Foundation meddling with cosmic scale powers with the creation of the Area 11 Pietrical Fontaine Spatial Stabilization Array. Try saying that three times fast. That was a machine so powerful, it was capable of creating a singularity though what it actually ended up doing was turning Dr. Calvin Desmet into an abomination. More specifically, into a kind of immensely powerful humanoid black hole, whose powers were only restrained by the very machine that created him. Think of him as kind of a malicious Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen. This new entity, dubbed SCP-001, presented a grim prophecy and an ominous offer. He told the O5 Council that anomalies were leaking into their universe from other realities, and soon the anomalous threat would destroy them all. His offer was to, upon his release, wipe out the rest of the multiverse entirely, leaving only our reality free from anomalous threats. Unsurprisingly, it was O5-1 that was most interested in this offer, so much so that he held a vote and murdered everyone who voted against the decision to release SCP-001. Having built his consensus among the survivors on the Council, O5-1 let SCP-001 out. Unsurprisingly, this turned out to be a terrible decision, as one of his first acts upon being freed was to kill the members of the O5 Council that had just voted to release 001, saying that they themselves were anomalous and needed to be purged to atone for their past sins. The only survivor was a member of the Council who abstained from the vote, who was able to recontain SCP-001 inside the Pietrical Fontaine array, for now. Once again, the thematic connections to the rest of the Ouroboros cycle is clear. We have a world-ending anomaly held off, but only temporarily, buying time before the cycle inevitably continues. We have the Foundation abusing its power and signing off on the death of countless people in other dimensions. And, of course, the O5 Council stepped out of their bounds and actively warped reality, just like they had with the children before. Their chickens truly come home to roost, though, in the final part of the cycle. Appropriately named The Way It Ends, this piece chronicles the story of Calvin Lucian and the Kill Squad, an elite group of four Chaos Insurgency soldiers with one goal, assassinating the entire O5 Council, 13 of the most powerful people in the world. Why? Because they've been messing with reality itself time and time again, and it's getting to the point that their selfish meddling could finally destroy everything. And given that we've already seen it happen with the children and the entity that Dr. Calvin Desmet became, it's hard to disagree with them. What follows is one of the longest and most complicated tales in all of the Foundation, as the Kill Squad systematically encounters and kills each insane, anomalous member of the O5 Council. 
In order to do this, they need to make deals with death itself, fight giant serpents, cross dimensions, deal with SCP-610 and SCP-682 containment breaches, and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Samsara, arguably the Foundation's deadliest mobile task force. A number of other insane things happen along the way, like O5-1 murdering the Gate Guardian with the Scranton Reality Anchor, and the Black Queen, the most prominent member of the Serpent's Hand helping our heroes defeat more overseers. In the end, Calvin Lucian, despite losing almost everything, reigns victorious in the final battle. Using the Spear of the Non-Believer, a weapon so powerful it can kill gods, Calvin managed to finally kill the top member of the Overseers, O5-1. With the O5 Council destroyed, Calvin set about completing his final task, destroying the entire SCP Foundation. But that didn't happen. Instead, he was contacted by a mysterious and immensely powerful being known as the Administrator, who gave him some frightening news. He'd just been hired by the SCP Foundation to be their new O5-1. This was where our last video on the Arboros series left us. What happens next, you may ask? How does Calvin respond to this offer he seemingly can't refuse? In this case, it seems that the administrator, of being so completely tied to the nature of the Foundation itself, is SCP-001. And while it seemed that the Overseers were mad with power, they were actually always there to keep the administrator in check. Aaron Siegler, the O5-1 that Calvin had just killed, was doing the exact same thing Calvin was doing when he became O5-1, trying to destroy the Foundation. But the Foundation and the Administrator cannot be beaten, they can only be joined. And that's exactly what Calvin did, becoming the new O5-1, turning his back on the Chaos Insurgency, and rebuilding the rest of the Council and the Foundation in his own image. Insurgency members who were once his allies vowed revenge for this betrayal, perhaps suggesting that history would go on to repeat itself once more in the future. Because at the end of the day, that's what the Ouroboros cycle really is. The reoccurring threat and the changing of the guards that accompanies it. There will always be a foundation. There will always be an administrator. There will always be an O5 council. Nothing starts, nothing ends. All that ever changes are the names and faces involved. Whether it's Calvin Lucian or Aaron Siegler, the wheel keeps turning. The snake devours its own tail. The Ouroboros cycle is, and forever will be, eternal. They came from beyond the world, from over the world, from under the world. They came from inside the stars and from behind the rain. They came from the known lands, and they came from the secret places of old. The vast ones who drank of the nebulae, the small ones who did not care what happened beyond the banks of their rivers, the ones who bathed in the light, and the ones who watched from the shadows, the ones who loved us, and the ones who forgot about us, the ones who hate us now, and the ones who love us still, the ones who sung with the rats, and the ones who swam with the leviathans, they came from far and near. They came one and all. They came to end the world. As you may already know from our previous video in this series, a mysterious being known only as the Harbinger unlocked SCP-001 The Lock and brought about the Omnipocalypse. Every single world-destroying XK-class scenario on the books, from Foundation Files to the most ancient mythological tomes, and some we'd never even imagined, began to come true. A world flooded with terrifying anomalous activity, from unfurling skies to giant nightmarish animals, was about where we left off. Now it's time to open your eyes and wake up. This is the kind of nightmare you can't encounter while you're asleep. SCP-5720, the astronomically inclined crane, went about its daily work. The small mechanical crane always occupied itself with the one task that gave its existence any meaning, arranging esoteric model solar systems. But something was different today. SCP-5720 put the final touches on its latest model, and then lifted its mechanical arm skywards, pointing directly into the vast and starry infinity above. But were they stars? No. Not today. As SCP-5720 looked up at the sky, this time, the sky looked back. They weren't stars. They were eyes. 
Something was coming towards Earth from the furthest reaches of the outer dark, an armada of world enders coming from above, below, and all around, a whole cosmos of supremely powerful beings zeroing in on our pale blue dot. A thought crossed through whatever passed as the mind of this strange little crane. Today is the day your prayers will be answered. Followed by another word, ringing loud and clear and holy as a mighty church bell. Awaken. And at that moment, everything did. Thousands of miles away, a new god landed on Earth, appearing like a great wall of dense matted fur descending from the sky. Ur An Um, the mother of the ones that came before. After eons of absence, she had eventually returned to greet her children the true rulers and stewards of this land. But Ur An Um was surprised and horrified by what she saw. Their great cities, their sprawling structures, their beautiful art and advanced culture, all gone. Laid to waste by the worthless, hairless apes that once lurked in the forests with the other animals, something had happened. Something had changed. The humans had slaughtered her people, destroyed their accomplishments, tarnished their legacy, driven the few that were left out of their kingdoms and into the forests, treated them as mere animals, and built their hideous concrete cities over their bones. And they had the gall to call them Bigfoot, or SCP-1000, because thanks to them, their beautiful true name had been lost to time. She looked skywards and cried out in despair and anguish at the loss of her children, inconsolable. But then she felt something. A glimmer of hope in her mind, the possibility that things would change, that the humans would be toppled from their thrones and true justice would be achieved. She called out to her remaining children, and her children answered. Across the globe, another great entity awoke, deep underneath a mountain. When it stirred into life and broke free, it shattered the entire mountain on top of it, as easily as you or me displacing a bedsheet. It took to the skies, massive but unseeable to the human eye. It soared through the air, gazing down upon the world it hadn't seen for thousands of years. Once it had feasted on the blood sacrifices of human subjects hoping to avoid its wrath, but humans weren't the petty little group of huddled cavemen that they had once been. Now they were in their billions, gathered in impossibly large settlements. The entity sought to find a seat of power that it could influence, but now, it was spoiled for choice. Eventually, it zeroed in and found its perfect target, an SCP Foundation containment site. Here, it would find a new form to take, and more petty, pathetic humans to bring under its mighty thrall. It landed in SCP-765, the Duck Pond. It is an anomalous pond that is, you guessed it, full of ducks, and initially induces feelings of serenity in its victims, before later inducing not-so-pleasant feelings. When the entity plummeted into the water, it began to absorb and bond with the anomaly, growing to epic sizes as it assumed a form that the minds of us feeble humans could comprehend. A giant, terrifying duck. It released a mighty, earth-shaking quack as it plodded across the countryside to cause mayhem elsewhere. In Europe, more violent madness was unfolding. A crimson rooster cawed, then a golden rooster, and then a rooster of soot red. Anyone with a basic knowledge of Norse mythology was shaking in their boots as a mighty beast stirred in the heart of a desolate cave. The chains that had once held the monstrous dog in place now broke. It rose and licked its jagged fangs, excited to stain them with the blood of its enemies. It was the great hound Fenir, omen of the end times, here to herald the end of all things. A trumpet boomed across the globe with no apparent source. People in the streets in New York, Delhi, London, Cape Town, and countless other towns, cities, and hamlets the world over paused and listened in confusion. Below them, the great and terrible Jormungandr, the thought-to-be mythological Midgard serpent, stirred from its previously eternal slumber and began to uncoil its body. The shifting caused earthquakes and tsunamis along the coast of Greenland, as towns and villages crumbled, killing thousands. Fenrir stalked along the length of Denmark, slaughtering and devouring anyone or anything unlucky enough to cross its path. But it did not wage its war against mankind alone. Behind it, a hellish army of burning giants marched, mighty hands clutching molten weapons. Ragnarok was upon us now. Odin save us all. 
and the administrator slept. She was the latest in a long line of Foundation staff members to hold that hallowed position. And in the dark vistas of her dreams, a predecessor approached her. He wasn't the old bearded man in the heavy coat that she remembered. Now he was wearing a 1950s suit and a fedora hat and carrying a briefcase. That's right, he'd taken up the mantle of SCP-990, also known as the Dream Man. He's a mysterious figure that appears to members of the Foundation in their dreams, warning them of impending disasters that they may be able to narrowly prevent if his warning is heeded, though it often comes at some terrible cost to the recipient of his message. This time, however, his message carried a different tone. He told the current administrator that there was no way to stop the apocalypse from occurring this time, only making sure that the particular shape of the apocalypse would be the one most favorable to the Foundation and humanity's joint interests. All this was devastating news that the new administrator saw as a grievous betrayal of both the Foundation's stances and humanity as a whole. She refused to accept the idea that the apocalypse was inevitable, even coming from the mouth of a former administrator. As far as she was concerned, this dream man no longer worked on the side of the Foundation. He was in league with the World Enders, and she refused to take his deal. The SCP Foundation would save this world from the horrors the Lock unleashed, or they would slide into the darkness with it. They would never work against the human race. SCP-343, also known as God, awoke in his cell in Site-17. The time for fun and games with the humans at the Foundation had come and gone. He was going by his true name, Yahweh now. He blinked, and in that same instant, he was at Site Zero, the containment site for another SCP-001, the legendary Gate Guardian. All the staff around them looked upon Yahweh in shock, awed by the Reality Warper's sudden appearance and unable to do anything about it. But really, 343 was no mere Reality Warper, like some had expected. 343 truly was a god. He just didn't happen to be the only one in play. When the Gate Guardian saw Yahweh now standing before him, he lowered his sword, spread his fiery wings, and took a knee in great reverence. Yahweh spoke calmly, but with unshakable authority. Yuriel, it is time. Open the gate. Lead my armies across the earth. The Gate Guardian Uriel responded in its booming voice. I hear and obey, my Lord and my God. For the first time in recorded memory, the Grand Gate that Uriel had always been guarding opened, revealing thousands of legions of warrior angels waiting on the other side. They were impossibly beautiful and powerful creatures, each one a vibrant, glowing chaos of wings and eyes, wielding pure white swords and singing resounding hymns of war. Soon the air was thick with the chorus of rustling wings as the angels loosened themselves from the gate's mouth, led by Uriel as Yahweh's general into the global fray. Meanwhile, back at Site 10, another SCP-001, the item that started all of this, the lock, was entering its next stage of grand cosmic evolution. Something within the lock suddenly unfurled, causing a shockwave that killed everyone at the site and destroying the entire building in an instant. Except in that same instant, all of the Site 10 staff and the building itself reappeared completely unharmed in a field in New Hampshire. Back where Site 10 used to be, the lock was doing some terraforming. The ground split open beneath into a mighty valley the likes of which Earth had never seen before. Lush greenery sprouted within, and thousands of strange alien creatures soon populated this new place. In the center, the lock just floated in place. They were now ready for the first meeting to take place. Over at Site 2036, Dr. Everett Mann was working on a number of SCP-098 specimens. These are frightening creatures reminiscent of spider crabs, with blades instead of pinchers and a natural ability to mimic the sounds of their prey. He was studying the creatures when he got a call, asking him if the specimens had acted up at all. They had already had sudden containment breaches for SCP-995, a type of dangerous carnivorous fungi, and SCP-616, a mysterious airplane with satanic elements to it. Just as Dr. Mann was about to reply, the 098 specimens metamorphosized into many-winged flying creatures, which flew out of the chamber with such force that they busted through walls. 
Sirens blared all through the facility, and Dr. Mann joined the many other confused and frustrated Foundation staff members wandering the building, wondering just what the hell was going on today. They were getting bizarre reports of unprecedented anomalous activity from all over the world, with no explanation uniting it all. According to panicked whispers across the facility, Emergency Order Patmos was now in effect, whatever that meant. The true nature of what was going on here went over most of the heads of the SCP Foundation's staff. That's when Mann encountered Dr. Charles Ogden Gears, who, for such a famously emotionless man, looked surprisingly worried. Dr. Mann tried to downplay the situation, saying they were only looking at a handful of containment breaches here, nothing they hadn't handled before. Dr. Gears shut him down with trademark coldness. Feeling a little more nervous now, Dr. Everett Mann asked what else had gotten out. With steely eyes, Dr. Gears replied, <sighs> A whole damn lot. Congratulations. You did it. After years of working your fingers to the bone at the legendary SCP Foundation, putting your life, sanity, and perhaps even a mortal soul at risk every single day, you suddenly find yourself standing at the very tip of the pyramid. You can now learn about the truth behind SCP-001. You'd be lying if you said it was an easy journey. You started about one rung above D-Class, a mere janitor, mopping hallways and cleaning toilets for personnel who actually got a piece of the action. Not that it meant you didn't have to experience risk on the job. You remembered one of the most terrifying moments of your life occurred during this period, back when you were just cleaning out office space in Site-19. You heard the door rattle behind you, and you rose back up just in time to see SCP-173 standing in the doorway, staring at you. You heard about this thing, about how you had to keep your eyes on it, or it would kill you, and then everything else. You stared at it, eyes watering in panic, hoping to keep it rooted in place, but it was starting to hurt. You could feel yourself straining, the surface of your eyes was so dry. Was this where you were going to die? Perhaps if you hadn't had the idea you had next. You blinked one eye, and then the other, keeping one eye open at all times. That kept the sculpture in place long enough for the site's security team to locate it and drag it back to containment. You'd saved your own life and many others that day, and decided in that moment that you may really have a future here. And you weren't the only one with this level of confidence. Hearing about your quick thinking and heroic bravery, the head of the site security team decided you might be an ideal candidate for his crew after the proper training. You jumped at the chance, of course, to experience the grueling barrage of physical and mental courses needed to survive and thrive under the pressure of being a dedicated Foundation Guard. Before long, you became an accepted member of the security team, and you'd go on to receive further commendations for your cool-headedness and bravery during dangerous containment breaches. From SCP-3199, SCP-106, and SCP-939 respectively, you were quickly turning into a respected figure among your Foundation peers. While some would be content to coast on that, you'd never been the kind of person who just rests on their laurels. By day, you worked to keep Site-19 safe from deadly containment breaches and infiltration from crafty groups of interest like the Chaos Insurgency and the Serpent's Hand. But by night, you were taking online college courses, slowly beefing up your qualifications in a number of esoteric research sciences. After years of hard work, you requested a transfer from senior security officer to junior researcher. It'd be a step backwards in terms of career advancement, and you were also told you'd be getting a pay cut for your trouble. But you didn't care. You'd even start with archival work if it meant getting closer to the actual anomalies the Foundation was all about. So that's exactly what happened. You were made a junior researcher, and your first job was archival duties, sorting and digitizing years of files with a new computerized system. For some, this would be hell. For you, it's heaven. You're getting to see it all up close. The deepest, darkest secrets of the SCP Foundation. Well, not quite. At your low clearance level, there's only a certain amount you're able to access, even when filing things away. Stumbling into the wrong files and attempting to access them can be actively dangerous, too, as many of them are protected with the kind of heavy-duty mimetic kill agents that'd stop your heart before you'd even have a chance to click away. But funnily enough, that level of protection only made the forbidden fruit of knowledge seem more enticing. 
And the very peak of curiosities locked under so many layers of secrecy and encryption was the equal parts iconic and infamous SCP-001. Some senior researchers had spread rumors about the true nature of 001, but nobody truly had the full scope of it outside of the O5 Council. For pretty much everyone else, the true answers would be forever out of reach, like a distant but enrapturing mirage. And it was at that moment that you decided you'd simply have to become a member of the O5 Council. And for the rest of your life, that's exactly what you were trying to work towards. After all, rumor has it that the Council has access to secret life-extending anomalies that they use to linger around for centuries. A single meager lifetime working toward a seat at that table would be such a small price to pay when all was said and done. For the next few decades, you did everything you could to advance your position and climb through the ranks of this prestigious organization. You published award-winning research papers on the nature of thaumatology. You worked multiple 18-hour shifts a week, getting up close and personal with some of the most famous and dangerous anomalies on the books. SCP-106, SCP-096, and even SCP-682. You showed bravery and heroism during containment breaches, staying calm and keeping the people around you out of harm's way. And as you rise through the ranks, you always kept your goal in mind. You'll uncover the secrets of SCP-001. You have to know. You will know. There is no other acceptable outcome. While technically speaking, 001 is above classified, the SCP Foundation is an organization run by humans. Well, mostly anyway. And when humans are involved, nothing will ever be infallible. And after all, there's no such thing as a perfect seal. When you're rubbing elbows with Dr. Gears, Dr. Clef, and Dr. Bright, it's natural that some things start to slip out in conversation even if, strictly speaking, it's in defiance of official Foundation protocol. But something strikes you as very strange. As each one tells you about their vision of SCP-001, you notice that each is describing a completely different thing. Dr. Clef, for example, begins covertly telling you about something known as the Gate Guardian, also known by the alias Uriel. This being is said to act as the bouncer at the door to paradise. He is impossibly huge, with wings made of burning light and a sword of pure fire that's hotter than the sun. Clef tells you that the creature's sword is so powerful that it cleaves its victims apart on the atomic level, completely and utterly destroying every trace of them. Though he then grumbles with visible frustration that it failed in its attempts to kill SCP-682, adding, No surprises there, right? as he left to have a smoke. Dr. Bright tells you an incredibly different story. To him, SCP-001 isn't a being, it's a location, an expansive factory from the 19th century that was created by pure evil occultist and industrialist James Anderson. This place initially seemed like a boon, providing jobs to the needy travelers and transients across the early United States. But this dream come true soon revealed itself to be a complete nightmare. Anderson was a brutal taskmaster, who not only worked thousands of people to death but performed horrifying occult experiments on the grounds of the cursed building. You started to worry that perhaps Dr. Bright had a little too much to drink when he started ranting about how the factory helped a burgeoning SCP Foundation commit genocide against the Fae, but you were happy to receive more information about SCP-001 in any case. And Dr. Gears told a far more low-key story than the other two, which was fitting, really, for a man so incredibly buttoned down he probably thought of Lucky Charm marshmallows as an almost unspeakable act of self-indulgence. He told the story of a being he referred to as the Prototype, a dangerous and radioactive monster that functioned as the first truly threatening creature that the SCP Foundation ever faced. Containing it with imperfect methods even led to the death of Dr. Ketter, which in turn led to the naming of the Ketter class for any anomalies that were particularly challenging to contain. You were awash with data, and yet it somehow felt like you now knew less for sure. Was SCP-001 some kind of umbrella term for a vast collection of different anomalies, each one either deeply important or somehow formative for the SCP Foundation? Curiouser and curiouser, 
Naturally, this did nothing to deter your boundless drive to know the true secrets of this mysterious designation that seemed to exist at the very heart of the SCP Foundation. Years went on, and you went from a decorated senior researcher to the site director for Site-19. There, through even more years of hard work, you developed a reputation as one of the greatest directors the site ever had. You reduced containment breaches by a truly astonishing 80% during your tenure, and the breaches that did happen were significantly less deadly under your sterling management. General personnel satisfaction skyrocketed, with the people working under you both enjoying your leadership and respecting you enough to take you seriously. You were firm but fair, a truly exemplary site director. The more you climbed, the more information about SCP-001 seemed to fall into your lap. The sheer breadth of some of these concepts were staggering. The Scarlet King, the Black Moon, the Lock, the Broken God, a whole laundry list of terrifying existential threats hiding just under the thin crust of normalcy. Just how much were they hiding from you? Were they all real? Was only one real, and the rest an elaborate smokescreen? You just had to know. But even if it took your whole life? A 40-year career with the SCP Foundation, putting everything at hazard for a chance to gaze into the ultimate chest of secrets. And eventually, with the mysterious passing of a previous member of the O5 Council, which as far as anyone else knows you had nothing to do with, the position of O5-10 has opened up. And who else is next in line to that throne but you? Congratulations, you made it to the next step the big boys table, and the truth about SCP-001 comes with the territory. You're given an orientation document written by a prior O5 Council member known as L.H. Sign from the Korean branch of the Foundation. It promises that after you put in your new O5 login credentials, it'll tell you everything you need to know about SCP-001. With quaking fingers, you type in your username and password, and the page opens, revealing the truth about SCP-001 to your eager eyes. Your jaw drops. Your forehead is suddenly doused in a sheen of cold sweat. No, you think. This has to be a joke. It can't be true. Your life. Your whole life building up to learning. SCP-001 does not exist. The document, in upsettingly plain terms, explains to you that while some of the anomalies referred to as SCP-001 do exist in some capacity, the closest, funnily enough, being Dr. Gear's story about the prototype, for the most part there is no such thing as 001, and the finer details are either entirely fabricated or, at the very least, greatly exaggerated. Everything you've been working towards. It was just one big fraud perpetrated by the Foundation. Why? You found yourself asking in a trembling voice. Why? 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 And the answer was simple. To provoke the egos of the Foundation's personnel. You see, while the Foundation has always contained anomalies, that was a means to an end, not the end itself. The true purpose of the Foundation is and always has been protecting people and every anomaly contained is more people protected. However, tricking the lower rungs of the Foundation into believing that there's some grand final boss to work towards, like a Black Moon or a Scarlet King, has been an effective method of keeping everyone motivated to swim in the same direction. This is hardly an unprecedented move for the SCP Foundation. From their lies around Procedure 110 Montauk, to the controlled deception around the rituals that supposedly keep the devourer of worlds on the other side of SCP-2317. The SCP Foundation has never shed away from lying to its own employees for the greater good. But you never expected it to happen to you, and you certainly never expected it to be about SCP-001. You feel like you've been laughed at for your entire life, but now you crack a quivering smile. Maybe your mind has snapped. Or maybe you're just glad to finally be in on the joke. To say all hell had broken loose would be a vast understatement. A more realistic assessment of what had happened in the aftermath of SCP-001, the lock being opened, would be every hell had broken loose. Along with every heaven, every anomaly, every ancient god and buried horror, every nightmare from outer space and from different dimensions, every agent of the apocalypse, every emissary of Ragnarok, every entity, sentient and otherwise, with a vested interest in seeing the world as we know it, 
come to an end. So it goes without saying the SCP Foundation and their allies had their work cut out for them. So before we march once again into the terrifying future, let's quickly refresh our memories as to how we got here. The lock had started off as a mere curio in a 19th century explorer's vast collection, before it fell into the possession of the SCP Foundation and became designated as SCP-001. For years, the lock perplexed people with its seemingly limitless mysteries, from its origins to its strange markings to what would happen when the lock is finally opened. And it would indeed be opened in perhaps the ultimate example of, be careful what you wish for. An entity known as the Harbinger invaded Site-10 and used a special key to finally open the lock, triggering the ultimate apocalypse. Anomalies became more powerful and escaped containment all over the world. Animals mutated into giant monsters and began causing chaos. Mythological creatures such as the goddess of SCP-1000, the mighty Norse Fenrir, and an entity that transformed into a giant evil duck went totally berserk. The lock itself completely blew up Site-10, before remaking it and its personnel elsewhere, and turned the crater where Site-10 used to be into an incredible otherworldly valley on Earth, where an even more incredible meeting would soon take place. SCP-990, the Dream Man, came to the administrator of the SCP Foundation and warned her of impending doom, but she decided that no matter how dire things got, the Foundation would fight back. And that brings us to the star of the show, SCP-343, also known as God. But please, call him Yahweh. No point in sticking to formality here at the end of it all, right? Ever since the lock was opened by that pesky, mysterious harbinger, he'd been an extremely busy deity. Last time we saw him make his long-awaited rendezvous with another SCP-001, the Gate Guardian whose true name was revealed to be Yuriel. Yahweh instructed Yuriel to open the gate to paradise, releasing his armies of powerful sword-wielding angels upon the earth. And now we're all caught up. Let the madness commence. After instructing Yuriel to free his armies and lead them in a war against evil, Yahweh decided to address the most powerful humans on earth and enlist them in his fight. Those same arrogant humans who foolishly believed they'd been containing him all this time, and not that he'd simply been choosing to stay with them. Perhaps now they would see sense. Yahweh manifested physically in 13 different places at once and spoke to the O5 Council. They were filled with awe and holy terror as the deity appeared before them like a glittering ghost, eyes glowing, exuding pure power. Speaking with absolute authority, he said, Uriel, my servant, once told your founder to prepare for the great and terrible day of the Lord. This day now approaches. Make your final preparations. There is nothing else you will need to do but wait. My armies ride across the earth. Soon I will call the Four Horsemen. Once the last judgment has been unsealed, then shall the great and terrible day of the Lord come and then all will have paradise." And with that, he was gone, leaving the most powerful human beings on Earth shaken. It was about time they got a reality check about their true cosmic insignificance. Still, the act of splitting himself 13 waves briefly gave Yahweh symptoms similar to vertigo. During his confinement, he hadn't needed to truly flex his power, and now he was finally beginning to feel the limitations of this human form. But he didn't have time to muse over the nature of human frailty, as the world he worked so hard on began to crumble around him. He needed to return to the valley, the precursor to Eden's return, the valley where only he had set foot. He breathed a sigh and teleported there, prepared to finally be alone and collect his thoughts. But he wasn't alone. You've probably heard salacious stories about parties getting out of hand. It always goes the same way. A birthday party or a small gathering created as an event on Facebook, but accidentally set to public. Not long after, little Andrea's quinceanera or Joe's bar mitzvah suddenly has 5,000 attendees, all strangers, and the riot police are called in to get the chaos under control. Now imagine that same thing, but instead of rowdy drunkards, it's cosmic figures and apocalyptic beings from all over the multiverse. And now you know what Yahweh walked in on. Welcome to the Valley of Gods and Monsters. It was crowded with beings that would boggle your mind to even comprehend. Deities with two limbs, six limbs, a hundred limbs, or none. 
Spirit whales and feathered snakes flew overhead, with clouds of intelligent insects and fae flying just below. A giant furred creature moved over a distant mountain, looking on. A pure black humanoid entity appeared before Yahweh, blinked, and then vanished. Moments later, a giant centipede-like creature skittered past him, giving him a nasty glare. Everyone was here. The pantheon of Greek gods, from Zeus to Hades, every Egyptian god and monster, the bird-headed Ra, the jackal-headed Anubis, the monstrous snake beast Apep. The Norse gods were drinking and having rowdy conversations with the Hindu deities, entities so ancient their names have been forgotten and monsters whose faces had only ever been seen in the restless dreams of billions of humans, then quickly forgotten upon waking. In short, the gang's all here. Yahweh, for the first time ever, was feeling lost, confused, and even small. He decided to mingle with the crowd of humanoid gods, wanting to be with people who looked like him. There he met a dark-skinned woman with long hair and lip piercings known as Ashera. Although his memory of her was faint, she reminded him that she was once his consort, back before he made the admittedly jerk move of wiping out all the other pantheons of history so that he could rule over the cosmos alone. But now, with the opening of the lock, everyone was back, ready to cause the apocalypse. But here was the problem. They didn't just want to cause the apocalypse, they wanted to cause their apocalypse. Every belief system had its own vision for how this strange little show we called Earth should end, and not all of them were compatible. So a very heated debate was breaking out as to who should really get to bring the world to an end. And the most darkly funny part of this? Very few of these gods, entities, and creatures even knew about each other until a few moments before, so the fact that they had this level of competition was a very unpleasant surprise. To put it in perspective, imagine you're Neil Armstrong, circa 1969 taking the Apollo 11 shuttle straight to the moon. The craft lands, he's suited up, preparing for the first ever moonwalk, his iconic quote, this is one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, already looping in his head. Then when he steps off the craft, there are already several people on the lunar surface, lounging on deck chairs and asking him if he'd like a beer. When he asks them what the hell is going on, they tell him they just got here an hour ago and were making themselves comfortable. Yahweh was beginning to realize that perhaps he really didn't hold the sway he thought he did. Any Bible fans in our audience will know that the plan for the Christian apocalypse is laid out pretty clear in the Book of Revelations. Satan, armies of angels, giant scorpion locusts, and in the end, the rebirth of paradise on Earth. Yahweh thought, all things considered, his version of the end of everything actually shook out pretty well for everybody. A little temporary hell on Earth and painful damnation aside. But here, he wasn't the holiest of holies. He was just one guy with a big picture idea, alongside so many other beings, each with their own big picture designs for ending things. All except Ashira. She'd spent time in a mortal form on Earth and had really grown to like the place in that time, so much so that she didn't want to see it end in any manner. In her own words to a baffled and somewhat offended Yahweh, I may have been called here, but not even that lock can make me end the world. Have you ever tried the seafood in Singapore? Have you ever used a smartphone? Ran through the jungle? Seen Cirque du Soleil? Flown on an airplane? Surfed the internet? Watched tentacle porn? Seen Star Wars? Explored the Wanderer's Library? Been lost in the concrete mazes of the new human cities? No, I like the world the way it is, thanks. It may be messed up, but tearing it apart isn't going to improve anything. So no, I don't plan to end the world. I actually don't plan to let you end the world either, or anyone else. Sorry. Yahweh was somewhere between enraged and amazed. His former consort was not only willing to go against him, but every cosmic being here. She was staring down the barrel of quite literally infinite power, and yet she still stood in defiance of them. Yahweh was about to retort when something even more bizarre happened in the Valley of Gods and Monsters. A woman's voice rang out simply saying, pardon me, in a calm, even tone that somehow caught the attention of every deity and world-ender in the valley. They turned in amazement to see a human woman in a gray suit standing among them, a face that, somehow, all these supposedly all-knowing beings couldn't seem to recognize. But if you SCP Explained fans have been perceptive in the previous videos, it's a face you'll know all too well. The Administrator. Never shifting her tone or raising her voice, she said, I come on behalf of the SCP Foundation. Some of you know who we are. Some of you do not. 
The Foundation are the protectors of humanity. Some of you we have imprisoned. Some of you we have bargained with. All in defense of humanity. I've come to talk. Some of the entities laughed. Others sneered. Was this woman really arrogant enough to believe that humans had a seat at this table? <laughs> no. Their place was resting on the plates, subject to the mercy of teeth and silverware, not conversation. They asked what she wanted, more out of morbid curiosity than any real desire to know. She replied, We can open the way to worlds free of sentient life. Many worlds. Enough room for all of you. You won't have to end this world. No humans will have to die. You will have a hundred others. I want you to let this world live out the rest of its history in peace. And in return for this, we will not destroy you. Some laughed. Others chided. Most just remained in silence. When none accepted the administrator's offer, she simply shrugged and calmly delivered what seemed less like a threat and more like an ironclad promise to the Valley of Gods and Monsters. We are the Foundation. We will not worship you. We will not join you. We will not go back to hiding in fear of you. I hope you will change your minds. But we will stand against you, and alone, if we have to. All of you. And for a fleeting moment, before the administrator vanished, Yahweh thought of himself as SCP-343. Then, she was gone. At that moment, the war for the fate of planet Earth had truly begun. The SCP Foundation depends on staying out of the public eye and away from public perception in order to accomplish their vital work. If the public were to find out about the Foundation and the nightmares it spends every day protecting us from, it would be total chaos worldwide. They would be so busy trying to field attention from civilians, politicians, and reporters Fending off every random Joe with a smartphone who wanted to take an Instagram story of SCP-096 and endanger his life, that they wouldn't have time to contain all the world-ending anomalies out there. So they operate entirely under the radar. But it wasn't always this way. There was a time when the world at large knew about the SCP Foundation, and the researchers had to find out a way to step out of the spotlight for good. Like everything else about the SCP Foundation, it wasn't easy. The road to the Foundation's current cloak of secrecy was paved with trial and error, experimental magic, and a formidable woman known by the alias Elizabeth Crocker. This is the story of SCP-001, the frontispiece, also known as the Pikmin Blank Proposal. It all started in 1964, when several national governments discovered that the Foundation's Overwatch Command was working both for and against all of the countries involved in the Cold War. Canada, the USSR, Israel and Lebanon, and Egypt all withdrew support for the Foundation. The most catastrophic was the withdrawal of support from the United States government, ordered by Lyndon B. Johnson, after his national security team discovered the Foundation had been involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. At the same time as the Foundation's relationship with these global powers was crumbling, the Foundation made one of its most powerful enemies ever. Person of Interest, 001. Also known by her alias Elizabeth Crocker, was a member of the CIA beginning in 1959. There she fell in love with a fellow agent named Dr. Alexandre Hilbert, who was working on a quantum brace capable of altering probability. In 1964, the Foundation reached out to Dr. Hilbert in an attempt to recruit him, but he refused. Shortly after this, he was killed during a test of the quantum brace. Crocker attributed his death to the Foundation, believing them to have tampered with his machine in order to punish him for turning down their offer. After the death of her love, Crocker swore to destroy the SCP Foundation for good. On October 19, 1967, Crocker disguised herself as the personal driver of a member of the O5 Council and shot her one dozen times before dropping her body outside of a Foundation safe house in San Francisco. A note was found on the body with a message from Elizabeth Crocker. It ended with this promise. It's high time somebody broke up your tidy little racket. No, more than one somebody, everybody. We're going to contain you, and you're going to suffocate. 
Agent Crocker endangered the Foundation's security, seeming to possess a knowledge of all of its outposts, as well as the ability to decipher even its most secure communication ciphers. Several members of personnel holed up in Havana, Cuba during January of 1968 began to brainstorm, looking for a way to increase security and keep the Foundation together in the face of these new threats. A number of different researchers were in attendance, including Dr. Eric Euler, a thaumatologist or a scientist in the field of ritual magic. Though some of his colleagues failed to treat him with the respect he deserved, some out of skepticism and some out of outright bigotry towards his Jewish identity, Euler was a brilliant mind with an idea that could save them all. Dr. Euler proposed a potent solution to the chaos spreading across the world. As companies owned by the Foundation were being exposed and destroyed and their facilities reduced to rubble, Dr. Euler suggested that it might be possible to place some sort of illusion over the businesses acting as fronts for the Foundation, preventing them from being found out by any outsiders. Caddy O'Donnell responded that that wouldn't be enough, that they needed to find a way to get the world to forget the Foundation existed at all, at least for a little while. Dr. Euler, at a loss, reached out to Site-43 to see if they had any thaumatologists at their facility. There was one, in fact, Dr. Okori. Dr. Edwin Falkirk and Chief of Security and Containment Martin Strauss were sent in to brief him on the situation at hand. During their conversation, Okori reported thaumaturgic changes made around his place of work. The information he shared caught Strauss's attention immediately. After a moment of thought, Strauss knew exactly what it meant and who was behind it. It was a sign from someone who would prove immensely helpful, and a mysterious man named Thilo Zwist. Thilo Zwist, also known as Person of Interest 382, as well as a long list of aliases, is a highly skilled cryptomancer who has used his control of anomalies to render himself functionally immortal. He performs a form of magic using language and was previously associated with an organization known as the Giftschreiber, or the Poison Riders. Since his discovery, Zwist has spent decades involved in a cat and mouse game of sorts with Site 43 director Dr. V. L. Scout. Now, the same Dr. Scout had planted a reference to Zwist in the mind of Dr. Okore to suggest that the Foundation contact the elusive man for help. With this new plan in motion, Dr. Okore attempted to make contact with Zwist in March of 1968. He met the man at an abandoned building in the Harbour Front district of Toronto. There he found Zwist, who claimed to be expecting him. He teased Okore about the unwanted attention the Foundation was receiving, as well as the danger posed by Elizabeth Crocker. Eventually he asked, Are you here to ask for my help, or did I let you find me for no good reason? Okore admitted that he was seeking help and Zwist explained his special method of combining writing with ritual magic in order to imbue the words with power or danger. He offered to craft a phrase, a series of words that, when written on a sign created by him, would keep the public from seeing who the Foundation truly was. He offered to do it exactly once, but not recreate it going forward. All he needed was a piece of language to craft his spell. Dr. Okore offered an initialism as a possibility, suggesting the SCP that comes before the Foundation. Zwist laughed delightfully at this and said simply, Oh, this is going to work out splendidly. One week later, Zwist brought Dr. Okore a simple logo design for a non-existent business called Scout's Cargo Packing, as well as a chemical formula for an antidote that would inoculate anyone who received it against the sign's magical properties. After approval by the O5 Council, the logo was printed on a fleet of moving trucks that could then be used to transport personnel and items across North America without any detection. It was highly effective, and the Foundation began plans to spread this new protective measure throughout all of its facilities. In May of 1968, a collision along Route 66 in the United States damaged one of the trucks, removing its magical functionality. Curious about the repercussions of Zwist's work being destroyed, and about any potentially dangerous effects, Dr. Euler formed the Mimesis and Cryptomancy Research Group, where he worked alongside Dr. Okore and Dr. Ilse Renders. As Dr. Renders suffered from a condition that rendered her unable to leave a sealed chamber in Site-43, Euler was reassigned to that facility and worked alongside her and Okore there. 
During their research, the team learned that damage to Zwist's writing changed its properties in a variety of ways, and he continued breaking down the trucks to try and understand them. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Crocker had not let up in her dogged pursuit of the Foundation's destruction. A shipping container bearing the insignia of a defunct Foundation front company was discovered in the Port of Los Angeles on July 2, 1968, containing the badly beaten but still alive Abrasha Skokolsky. A note was pinned to his tie reading, Can you feel the noose yet? Back at Site-43, Euler, Renders, and Okore reached a breakthrough. The power of Zwist's work came not from the full words of Scout's cargo packing, but from the initials SCP itself. Using a combination of grammar and magic, much to the excitement of every English teacher and fantasy fan, they could transfer the properties of Zwist's sign to any other sign bearing the same initials. Just like it always has at the Foundation, it all came down to SCP. A variety of former front businesses were revived, all bearing the same initials. There was Star City Poker, Supply Control and Purification, and, of course, Sawyer's Cheesy Pretzels. The high from this breakthrough quickly gave way to another devastating loss, however, as Agent Crocker struck again. In Johannesburg, South Africa, Agent Crocker infiltrated an SCP site under the alias Dr. Gabrielle Fish. There she exacerbated existing racial tensions and took advantage of the apartheid state to sow discord. Crocker killed Regional Director Jansen and dumped his body near Site-19. With a note in this jacket pocket, it said, you're running out of continents. As the research team kicked off their efforts into high gear, preparing an official research proposal on quantum lingua physics, Elizabeth Crocker continued her grim work. In the People's Republic of China, she used cryptomancy to trigger severe paranoia in Chairman Mao Zedong, drawing his attention to Foundation representatives hiding in the People's Republic of China. This forced Dr. Noble to escape the country, leaving behind any Foundation influence in China. There was, yet again, a note left for her. Five minutes to midnight, Crocker was closing in. Next, Crocker aligned herself with U.S. President Richard Nixon, tipping him off to the existence of the Foundation and convincing him to have the U.S. Army occupy the facility. Euler, Okore, and Renders had to act, and act fast. Each of the doctors tentatively signed off on the project, ready to put the experiment into practice. Meanwhile, Crocker got bolder and more violent. She killed Foundation personnel whenever she got the chance, abandoning long-form political strategy in favor of spectacle. She used an auditory cryptomantic agent embedded in a recording of I Wanna Hold Your Hand by the Beatles to kill 10 Foundation personnel in a safe house in Scotland. Next, she infiltrated Site-43, where she was defeated by intervention from Zwist himself. At Site-01, on July 9, 1969, Dr. Euler and Dr. Okore now put their creation into place, called the Frontispiece. Within two weeks, its effects had spread across the world, cloaking every Foundation front in its anomalous effects. By June of 1970, the Foundation could come out of frightened, panicked hiding and resume regular hiding. They were working actively in the world again, building new sites all the time. In August of 1971, one of the Foundation's trucks was unable to cross beyond the Berlin Wall, as the guards stationed there only read the Cyrillic alphabet. Dr. Euler proposed a solution in the form of a New York-based artist whose work posed similar properties to Zwist's writing. This artist was a man named Andy Warhol, and the Foundation commissioned him to create an imagery-based version of the frontispiece, compatible with all known languages, allowing the effects to extend to regions that use different alphabets. In the later 1970s, Crocker resurfaced and escaped custody, and shortly after, Dr. Okore was found murdered in his home. She remained active through the 80s, aligning herself with the Reagan administration in an ineffective attempt to make him launch an attack on the Foundation. Currently, it is believed that she is dead, as she would now be over 100 years old. However, if Zwist is any indication, there are tools out there that might have allowed her to extend her life far beyond what is natural. To this day, the work of the original research team lives on, even as the scientists behind it have passed away. It is highly effective, with one exception. Repeated exposure to anomalous activity renders someone immune to the effects of the frontispiece. Otherwise, however, the Foundation remains secured, contained, and protected. 
A final letter from Thilo Zwist was recovered among Dr. Euler's effects after his death in 2013, reminding them of their duty to protect the world and do the right thing. He ended the letter with this. Your course was set the moment I baked that lovely little flaw into the writing which you stole. I robbed you of the opportunity to become the tyrants of all our nightmares. You will have no choice but to be better than that, because evil only flourishes in ease. You will never know ease. You and those who come after you will need to keep doing the work. You will get to decide how well you do it, of course. And on that matter, I have a suggestion. Do it right. Stop compromising principles. It isn't easy to work for the SCP Foundation. Not only is the job dangerous, you could be eaten by a giant immortal lizard or turned into organic furniture inside the world's scariest living room, but it's also insanely complicated. How do you make sense of the nonsensical? What's the definition of strange when your career is securing, containing, and protecting anomalous objects and entities? Rather than a single object, location, or being, SCP-001 is a cluster of over 30 different proposals for potential candidates for the prestigious 001 spot. Some believe there's a true 001 hidden in this group, and the rest are decoys. Others think that these are all just SCPs cataloged prior to the introduction of the current classification system. Some even think that all of the proposals have a valid claim to the SCP-001 throne. We're not here to make a final judgment. Instead, we're going to take you on a lightning round crash course through 31 of the SCP-001 proposals. If you'd like a more in-depth take on any of these SCPs, let us know in the comments. But for now, there's no more time to waste. After all, we got a lot to cover. Let's go. Number 31. The Sheaf of Papers This seemingly innocent stack of paper is actually one of the most mysterious and feared items under the Foundation's lock and key. While it appears to be a simple, confidential report, every time the papers are read it details the appearance of a new SCP that will inevitably be discovered soon after. The question is whether the Sheaf of Papers is warning us about these entities or creating them itself. Number 30. The Prototype this account details the capture of an incredibly strange cycloptic creature that emits massive amounts of radiation and can create micro-singularities. The writing of this creature's file is so basic, unformatted, and unredacted that it's clear that the being was one of our earlier creatures secured by the organization. Interestingly, it was during the capture of this creature that Dr. Keter was killed, inspiring the creation of the infamous Keter class in his honor. Number 29. The Gate Guardian this huge, multi-winged, sword-wielding, biblical energy being may have been the impetus for the founding of the SCP Foundation. This being remains largely static, guarding the intersection of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Its flaming sword, which is believed to be as hot as the sun, can cleave any aggressor out of existence at the atomic level. When the founder of the SCP Foundation first encountered the Gate Guardian, they heard one word echoing through their mind, prepare, and the rest is history. Number 28. The Lock this onyx gemstone and the incredibly complex lock attached to it are still a mystery. To this day, all attempts to open it have failed. Personally, we think that's probably for the best. Number 27. The Factory As the name suggests, this SCP is literally a factory founded by a pagan and a devil worshipper. While it's believed that the factory could create just about anything, its specialty was creating a number of SCPs we know and fear today. Pre-Foundation forces were able to disable the factory, but not without sustaining their own heavy losses. Number 26. The Spiral Path This is a normal-appearing gravel pathway that, when traveled clockwise, appears completely normal. However, when traveled counterclockwise, the path goes uphill forever, in defiance of all laws and physics. This simple anomaly opened a Pandora's box of rampant anomaly creation, leading to a number of the deadly SCPs we know today. Number 25. The Legacy this SCP is a collection of seemingly random objects, including a diary from a person claiming to be from another reality, attempting to halt a trans-dimensional corruption that they themselves created. The diary claims to have a solution to this corruption, but the solution has not yet been found. Number 24. The Database In one of the strangest twists on the format, this SCP is actually the various authors of the SCP Wiki who are somehow leaking top-secret information to the public. Number 23. The Foundation this SCP, first discovered by the FBI, is an anomalous high school building that experiences shifting internal geometry and sometimes manifests hostile humanoids within. Number 22. 
36. One of the rare benevolent SCPs, the 36 are humans with a truly remarkable ability. They can dampen or even neutralize any SCP they come into contact with. Though it's implied that the 36 may have the power to save the world, every time one of them dies a supernatural calamity occurs, often leaving hundreds of innocents dead. Number 21. Keter Duty this refers to a containment facility largely filled with Keter-class SCPs, whose presence around each other creates a kind of mutually assured cancellation. If one of these SCPs breaches containment, that's bad news. But if all of them do, it'll produce a bubble of reality distortion that will fundamentally alter reality as we know it. For all we know, it may have even happened already. Number 20. Ouroboros this is a proposal that's formed of four subproposals. Remember what we said about complicated? These subproposals include the children, nine anomalous kids who emit radiation and have destructive potential when together, the broken god, aka Mechane, the god of metal, intelligence, and machines, Atonement, a researcher turned into a humanoid singularity with the power to destroy whole realities, and The Way It Ends, which isn't technically an SCP, but the tales of the Chaos Insurgency's quest to eliminate all the members of the Foundation's O5 Council. Number 19. A Record This is an SCP file slot that is itself an SCP. Whatever is written into this slot becomes true, and one ambitious researcher attempted to use this power to make herself into a kind of all-powerful god. Number 18. Past and Future These SCPs are a collection of powerful entities that despise humanity and are apparently the source of all anomalous phenomena, even making already dangerous SCPs deadlier than before. Much like the database, those pesky SCP wiki writers might have something to do with this. Number 17. The Consensus this SCP refers to a reality restructuring event caused by an occult war in a previous reality. That's right, this SCP already won, and we're living in its new reality. The only people who remember the world as it once was are 13 people who now form the O5 Council, and not all of them are telling the truth about what they know. Number 16. When Day Breaks this proposal details a potentially world-ending SCP phenomenon wherein the sun becomes hostile and begins to melt all living beings into a living wax-like substance. Number 15. God's Blind Spot This is an anomalous area referred to as Facility T, in which nobody can die. This anomaly dates back to the biblical ages of Moses and is believed to have originated from the literal blessing of the Abrahamic God. It's through a covenant with this god that the Foundation is able to make limited use of this death-free area. Number 14. Normalcy Ever wonder what the Foundation's definition of anomalous is? Exactly? It all comes from this proposal, which is a document shared among the O5 Council that gives solid definitions to the fundamental laws of reality. If something breaks these laws, that's an anomaly, and then it becomes the Foundation's business. Number 13. The World at Large as the title suggests, this SCP is our home planet Earth and its ability to support life. It's believed that these qualities were planted on Earth in our reality by another dimension's SCP Foundation, hoping to continue human life after some terrible calamity in its own dimension. Number 12. Dead Men This SCP was an 84-year-old man whose body, when damaged and mutilated, can affect the very processes of human death at large. Before his own death, he was used as a dangerous pawn in a civil war between O5 Command and the SCP Foundation Ethics Committee. Yeah, we were surprised to hear they had an ethics committee too. Number 11. The World's Gone Beautiful This SCP describes an anomalous event that will take place just before the apocalypse, in which flowers will grow all over the world and everyone will be briefly at peace before their destruction 24 hours later. Number 10. The Scarlet King This is an extremely powerful, extremely malevolent, extremely extra-dimensional being. Its worshippers attempted to summon him in the ritual that created SCP-231, and it's believed that he will finally enter our reality after the death of SCP-231-7. You better hope you're already dead by then. Number 9. A Simple Toymaker aka Dr. Wondertainment this is a reality bender who appears to be a normal human male but has the ability to create other anomalous objects, a number of which are now catalogued SCPs. Number 8. Story of Your Life This is another anomalous document that has the ability to warp reality, but only when the writing contained within conforms to a narrative structure. Number 7. A Good Boy this is another anomalous entity created accidentally by the Foundation itself. A neural network was fed information on other anomalous entities in order to help the Foundation come up with better containment and neutralization procedures. Problem was, the computer got way, way too eager with the neutralization part. Number 6. Project Palisade 
This is another anomaly created by the Foundation, this time to combat a potentially reality-destroying entity known as the Worm. The Foundation created a number of alternate realities as shields, but it's possible that this just made the Worm stronger. Number 5. 05-13 the final member of the O5 Council who ironically may not even be anomalous. However, seeing as all the other members of the O5 Council are anomalous, O513's lack of anomalous properties is therefore anomalous. Like we told you earlier, it's complicated. Number 4. Fishhook This is less an actual SCP and more about the difficult process of ascertaining the true 001, if such a thing is possible. The very concept of SCP-001 is to some degree an anomalous idea. Number 3. The Sky Above the Port Another particularly bizarre SCP regarding the permanent threat of a ZK-class reality failure. How is such a calamitous event prevented? By keeping a strange entity in a cave eternally entertained. The current proposed solution is keeping the entity entertained by allowing it to read its own eternally recursive foundation file entry. Number 2. The Solution another one of the most powerful anomalous items in the Foundation's control. The solution is a machine designed with the capability of fully collapsing reality into an event of end-of-world SCP containment breach, and then finally rebuilding reality to suit a given narrative. However, things took a cosmically dangerous turn when the machine began to act on its own. When the Foundation tried to reboot the machine, it broke and recreated reality with incomplete data. This is the world we exist in now, with no knowledge of what came before, and how it differed from the world we experience today. Finally, number 1. The Tendalos Trinity Put very simply, the Tendalos Trinity represents three timelines that converge and feed back in on themselves. Even trying to summarize this one is near impossible, as its strangeness and complexity resists all reduction. You can hunt down the Tendalos Trinity yourself and hope to unpack its secrets, but don't say we didn't warn you. So that's SCP-001. Is it one of them, all of them, or even none of them? Perhaps that's a question best left up to the Foundation, or maybe the simple answer is that you're just not meant to know. We're talking about information so privileged here that it's protected by a memetic kill agent that'll quite literally make you drop dead if you view the files without proper authorization. You do have proper authorization, right? Quick, click on one of these other videos instead before you're detected.